Check, check, one, two. Hello? Whoa. Sorry. Is it, for just one more minute while we get the technology working. Is James here? Come sit in the front. He can sit, he can just sit next to Gino right here. Sorry. Two more minutes. Three more minutes. So far documented a remarkable 58 ancient shipwrecks in Greece's eastern Aegean Sea. Denea. All right. Is this on? Uh, hello, good morning, and welcome. And for the Greeks in the audience, Kalimera ke kalasirtate. Uh, my name, as Milbury said, is Danae Buckingham. I'm an explorer, filmmaker, and anthropologist, and I have had the honor to be a member of this club since 2016. I am honored to be here today to return Flag 69 to you, which, as Milbury said, we carried to the archipelago of Furnicorseon in Greece's eastern Aegean Sea last September. Now, if I can figure out how to work this thing. Oh, fading on. So, in 2020... We also unfortunately lost one of our core team members who had been with us since the beginning, Marcos Garas. He was a physicist, a diver, an engineer, and a beloved dad. So this field season was dedicated to the memory of Marcos Garas. Now, we are honored to be developing a bit of an explorer's club pedigree. In fact, this was the third expedition to locate and document for new shipwrecks on which we have flown the Explorers Club flag. In 2017, we were supported by an Explorers Club Rolex grant, which was awarded to Dr. Peter Campbell, one of our lead archaeologists. This past year's expedition was made uh, possible in large part by an Explorers Club discovery grant, for which we are extremely honored and grateful. Now, I only have 15 minutes today, so I'm going to try to give you a quick overview of our work in Furni, our ongoing archaeological expedition, as well as this year's significant results. And if you have any questions, we can discuss over a bit of a drink on the terrace later. So, in 2015, a local spear fisherman uh, phoned the Greek effort of antiquities, saying that he had seen a lot of ceramics 
underwater whilst freediving around the coastline of his small archipelago of Furnin Coseon. That same year, Dr. Yorgos Kutsuflakis conducted a preliminary underwater survey and, astounded by the wealth and diversity of the ancient shipwreck cargo that he found, secured the permits immediately to begin an ongoing field expedition to the islands. That first year in 2015, the team found 22 shipwrecks dating from approximately 600 BC until around the 17th century AD. That following year in 2016, we found another 23. This is where our 2021 field season took place, which is on shipwreck 15 uh, up here on Afroscavos, which I will talk with to you about uh, in a moment. So at that point, this little known cluster of islands became famous and was heralded as the ancient shipwreck capital of the world. I joined the expedition in 2017 as a dive master and for field documentation through photography and cinematography. That year, we located another eight wrecks. So before the pandemic hit us, we had documented, identified and documented a total of 58 ancient shipwrecks and we still have about 50% of the coastline yet to survey. So, the plan in 2021 was to begin testing two shipwrecks, which are potential candidates for excavation out of 58. You can imagine there's lots of, lots of choice, but these two had significant cargo that might be interesting to uh, unearth new archaeological data. Shipwreck 15, which is from the Black Sea, which we believe dated from the 3rd or 4th century AD, and then Shipwreck 53 with a cargo of Roman Amphora from the 5th or 6th centuries. Unfortunately, due to some weather and equipment malfunctions, we had to make a choice of only one wreck to focus on for this field season, so we chose Shipwreck 15. Now, our team this year was made up of 22 people, archaeologists, engineers, conservators, commercial divers, and media professionals. This year's expedition yielded not only exciting new archaeological data, but also pioneered the use of a unique technological system, which I'll talk to you about later also, that was actually developed by our underwater engineers. We worked off of a commercial diving vessel, which we lovingly called the Pantoflaki, and for any Greeks in the audience, that means the little flip-flop. If you can kind of imagine the little engine that could, like tough pirate brother, it was this boat. So now I'm going to show you some footage from our expedition season so you can get the idea of what it feels like to be on one of our dive teams. So we fly over Asproskavos, which means the white cape in Greek, and you can see the Pantoflaki over in the distance over the wreck site. We executed all of our dives from there, traversing back and forth from a small coastal settlement by speedboat. Now, Wreck 15 is a deep water excavation located at 43 to 49 meters, so about 141 to 160 feet for the American audience. We dive on air to work with extended bottom time at, due to two decompression stages uh, on 50% oxygen at 21 meters and then 100% at 6. So we lay an excavation grid from which we then methodically, slowly, and carefully use a gentle suction dredge to remove sand and sediment from the artifacts um, in each of four test squares, noting all finds uh, and artifacts. This year's primary objective was not raising artifacts. In general, we are... Can I turn the sound down on that? It's louder than I expected. Okay, thank you. Uh, in general, we are careful only to raise a small selection of artifacts just to provide us enough sort of sufficient evidence in order to identify the type of cargo amphora and therefore determine the wreck's origin and approximate date range. You can see in the video our divers working in the grid. Uh, the wreck's cargo of amphora on this particular wreck consists of at least six different kinds, types of amphora most of which come from ceramic workshops in the northern and southern Black Sea, except for one type whose origin has not yet been identified. Significantly, we also found uh, tableware ceramics, which led to a redating of the entire cargo load from a fourth century later, from the third or fourth century AD to the fourth or fifth century AD. Now, towards the end of the expedition, we also raised an extremely rare Casab Tesgor of the Roman Amphora of Sinop of Pontus. This is an extremely rare artifact, and I'll show you a photo of it in just a moment. 
And in fact, it's made our Shipwreck 15 the only known wreck with this type of cargo from the Black Sea in all of the Mediterranean. This is a 3D programmetry model by, made by this man, Dr. Kotaro Yamafune of Japan. It's a collection of high resolution images which we make at periodic intervals uh, during our research so that we can study the wreck in situ without having to send divers down continuously because obviously at 45 meters you get a very limited bottom time. Now another important addition to this year's technical, technological English tonight, advancements was this system, the Noose Learning Algorithm Based Live Streaming System, which was developed by our diving engineers and allowed us to actually watch each dive team in real time, streaming from the wreck site, from the seafloor. It actually works up to a, around 100 to 150 meters underwater. So the system's going to now be installed permanently around the site in order to protect it from any potential looting, encroachment by fishing vehicles, divers, etc. It allows for long-term study of the underwater environment where we can monitor this from anywhere, from the cloud. We can stream it from phones right here, right now. Um, it also allows us to watch the wreck over time for potential change in the wreck, change in marine environments, uh, etc. And it's all solar powered and self-sufficient. So, this is the amphora that I mentioned to you, so you can see it is indeed massive. <laughs> so, here are some of our results. Despite, as I said, challenges of some bad weather and equipment malfunctions, 2020, the 2021 field season was extremely successful. Our team executed a total of 303 individual dives, and we spent a total of 227 and a half hours underwater on this rare deep water excavation. We were able to reclassify Shipwreck 15 a century later, from the 3rd or 4th century AD to the 4th or 5th century. Additionally, this amphora that I showed you, the Kassab Tesgor, will illuminate new aspects of maritime trade between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea from this era of Roman occupation. Due to political and linguistic barriers, many aspects of the Black Sea's contribution and role in shaping the Roman economy remains unknown, and so our expedition will be crucial in shedding light on maritime traffic and trade in this of liquid products specifically from the Black Sea to the Aegean and the entire Mediterranean, covering a huge historical and archaeological gap in research. We are already in the planning stages for the 2022 field season, wherein we will continue our excavation and expect to uncover even more history in the remarkable archipelago of Fournicorsayan. You can read more about our expedition online at corsay.com or on social media at Corsay or Archaeology. Thank you again to the Explorers Club and Discovery for supporting our ongoing expedition. And on behalf of our entire team, who would have loved to all be here with you today, Thank you so much, Denea. And I now, as typical Explorers Club fashion, we have a special insert. Um, I'm going to ask Brian Hansen to come up to the podium. You announce, you announce it. Are we working? It's uh, my extreme pleasure to introduce Patty Carpenter, the uh, wife of uh, our very good friend Scott Carpenter. And just a little bit of history there. As you know, Scott was a good friend of uh, many of ours here, Richard. And uh, we lost him in uh, October of 2013. 
But uh, in a board meeting in 2012, uh, I brought up the idea of a special award for John Glenn and Scott Carpenter, who were the first two men to uh, Americans to orbit the Earth. And this is the 60th anniversary, right? Uh, it was exactly 60 years ago, between February and May, that uh, John Glenn and Scott Carpenter went into orbit and really started the whole business. They were part of uh, Mercury 7. Uh, those members included John Glenn, Alan Shepard, uh, Scott Carpenter, Gus Grissom, Wally Shira. Wally Shira. And uh, a lot of you all know that uh, Scott really had two lives. He was, we've just seen a very nice presentation on uh, scuba diving and uh, uh, exploring underseas. And that was a, a, a special love of uh, Scott Carpenter. He was, first of all, uh, a pilot, a test pilot, an astronaut, but he was also an aquanaut. And he worked with Sea Lab 2. Yeah, he was, was he first and only? I don't know. Maybe, maybe Kathy no, Sullivan's in there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> Kathy and, and also uh, Buzz O'Brien. Yeah, a lot of them had uh, dive certifications. Exactly. But uh, so we decided that we would have a very special medal made for John Glenn and Scott Carpenter, and we called it the Legendary Explorer Medal. There are only two of them in the world, and uh, the mint that made them, the Franklin Mint, uh, went out of business. And I asked for the, the, uh, the mold for this, uh, Patty, and they said they got rid of the mold. So there are only two of them, and one of them is with uh, John Glenn's family, in Ohio and the museum up there, and the second one is here. And uh, Patty has agreed to loan the medal to the club for display. Uh, it belongs to her family, but it's, it's such a lovely medal, and hopefully some of you all got to see it last night. But you want to show that? And, and Patty, I'll let you say a couple of words. Well, it seems appropriate that I'm going to lend this medal to the Explorers Club because it's 60 years ago, May 24th, that Scott did the heroic thing that he did by circling the Earth three times in the Mercury capsule. So it's 60 years ago, and so this is nice to be able to present this to the Explorers Club because, of course, he was an explorer. And uh, I, Brian said just about everything I could tell you, um, and if you want to know anything else. But uh, Scott was the first astronaut, aquanaut. He worked underwater with the Navy, and he was uh, 30 days under the water in a habitat, of course. And um, you probably all know his history, but it's quite a nice one, so... But it was interesting to me that at the end of his life, probably the last three years, people wanted to talk to him always about space and what he had done and, and that kind of thing. But they were very interested in his ocean knowledge and his exploration of the ocean. So he was very close to that um, discipline, you might call it. And uh, so he... He'd like to be remembered for that also because um, when they talk about conservation, uh, Scott, to me, was one of the first conservationists before they used that word because um, recently I was just going through some of our files, and this is how Scott lived. Uh, one of the files, instead of throwing the file away and putting a new file, right, new name on it, just those paper files that we file things in. He had taped it up so he could use it again. So to me, that was Scott personified about what's happening now, and he lived that as far as conservation. Another interesting thing to me that I recently found some papers of Scott, and I don't know if I'll be able to say this exactly right. I should have written it down 
but I was just re reading one of the papers, and one of it was about the cooperation that they had, they being the American astronauts, had with the Russian cosmonauts. And oftentimes we travel with the cosmonauts, so it's kind of a sad story for us right now. Uh, but Scott felt that there was always cooperation, not he used another word. What would the other word be that's the, opera, the opposite of cooperation? But at any rate, that's how he felt and they felt about the Russians. And so we both progressed in this world, in my opinion, uh, through their scientific adventures, both the astronauts and the cosmonauts. And Scott was quite fun, fond of the cosmonauts. And as you well know, lots of us, not me, but lots of <laughs> us Americans, have gone up with the Russians in their spacecraft and been, you know, and they came back. <laughs> so uh, thank you for being interested in his medal. And I think it's a beautiful one. And I hope you all get a chance to enjoy it and think about Scott and our early space program. And don't forget it. One, one final word, one final word before the medal is given over is that this was given, Richard, this was given at the ECAD of 2013 to John Glenn and Scott Carpenter. Well, you can see at, at our club, we are, uh, Richard just took it, we always have a lot of historic firsts, so I'm, I'm glad. And we have the next flag return is also an historic first. Uh, we have James Raffin, who is, um, was named in 2020 by the Canadian Geographic as one of Canada's most influential explorers. They said that he was a world backcountry explorer, author, and authority on north, the north and canoeing. He put a human face on climate change by traversing more than 17,000 kilometers along the Arctic Circle, uncovering circumpolar stories of changing societies and landscapes. In the spring of 2019, James traded his parka for a full-body sunsuit and joined the expedition Mapping Ground Zero. The research team traveled for 30 days aboard a 15-meter uh, Polynesian sailing canoe documenting the remote northern atolls of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, part of a five-year project to gather data for the first comprehensive atlas of this threatened and disappearing place and people. Raffin was the cultural geographer and documentarian on the Atlas team, led by fellow Canadian Dr. Danko Taborski. James? Thank you, Millbury. Good afternoon, everyone. The flag wasn't the only thing I took to the Marshall Islands. In 2015, it was my first ECAD. Fred Roots was winning the Explorers Club medal that year. Uh, I wanted to show you that I took my $10 watch. I bought a ticket at the 15 ECAD, and um, it was a nice watch, but as a Canadian, I declared it when I went home, and my prize required $970 HST to get it into Canada. <laughs> <laughs> when Danko Tabarossi, uh, who I met in the Arctic, uh, said, James, I know you love canoes. Would you like to come with me and help on this uh, Atlas project in the Marshall Islands? I said, sure, Danko, where are the Marshall Islands? And so, 
They're in the middle of the Pacific, and we all know uh, Bikini, and we know the, the, uh, that was the place where a lot of nuclear testing was done, and so they're in our hearts. But as an atoll community or a country in the, uh, in the middle of the Pacific, they are experiencing climate change uh, in a way that is uh, the changing sea chemistry is, is changing the, uh, what they catch, but it's also changing how the sea is interacting with their homes. And um, Donko has uh, been part of uh, a team making atlases for other uh, countries in the Pacific. And um, he put together this ragtag bunch of uh, very wonderful people from six different countries, and uh, off we went. But uh, the carrot for me was that we, tra <laughs> we traveled in a Polynesian sailing canoe. And I have to just tell you, it's, uh, it's about the length of a school bus. And uh, this is a deluxe uh, accommodation, I can assure you. You can eat the fuel, uh, the uh, coconut oil. It had two screws uh, in addition to the wind. Uh, which is nice. You can have as much salad oil as you want. No salad, but... Uh, and uh, to give you a little tour, for those of you who might want, this is part of a family of these vessels that are being made by the o Okeanos Foundation. Uh, they're made in New Zealand. And um, just to give you a little walk through, there's a, there's a locker at the front for your inflatables that you use to go ashore, sails and that kind of thing. The uh, forward staterooms are there. Let's call them staterooms. Um, the aft uh, staterooms are uh, are here. Uh, where are we? There we are. Starboard, actually, the starboard aft is where the crew stays, uh, at least part of the crew. Crew of five, Marshallese. Um, the captain and the uh, the watch uh, commander could sleep in the deck house if they wanted. But uh, I wanted to. Oh, and then the rear on the uh, starboard side is the is the head, and on the uh, on the port side is the uh, is the galley, deluxe galley kitchen. Uh, there it is. And just to give you an idea uh, about whether you think we were uh, 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 traveling for 30 days with an exotic uh, diet, that tiny little cooler there was enough cold and frozen. That was all our cold and frozen food for 11 people for 30 days. Uh, I want to take you into my stateroom now, <coughs> uh, which was good, uh, except that we did <laughs> share it with a motor that was running a lot of the time. Uh, Don Budin and I, the, he's a biologist, and uh, when we would land on an atoll, he'd be out all night, which was kind of nice because if I didn't sleep on the, uh, on the, on the beach, I could, I could have the place to myself. But then he'd come home and fill, fill the place with formalin and other smells because he was interested in looking at the speciation of these, uh, of these atolls and changing atolls. So that was just a, it gives you a kind, of a kind of a tour there. To put it into perspective, um, the team in various other t various other configurations had gone to the, uh, the populated atolls of the Marshall Islands by available means, so by by ship and by air and so on. But the northern atolls, particularly Bicot and Bulcock, um, are really not accessible. I mean, from Majuro, where you would land on the island hopper that comes out of Honolulu, that goes out one day and comes back another, it's about uh, almost 900 nautical miles to the north end. So uh, going on a sailing vessel really makes sense. And um, we actually did a great big circle. We were hoping to go Majuro to Majuro, but we ended up going Majuro to straight north, eventually to Bocock. Uh, and uh, although people have been on these places, and there is historical documentation, um, there is not exhaustive or, or, or uh, systematic documentation of these places. Then we came south and went out as far as Bikini and then came back to Kwajalein and actually caught the island hopper at Ebai instead of at Kwajalein instead of coming back to Majuro. So my experience with atolls uh, prior to this was very academic. As a Canadian who spent 40 years in the Arctic, uh, there aren't a lot of atolls that I've encountered there. But uh, I just want you, I want you to just but look at the last, uh, there, there's a kind of, so you get a volcano, you get a reef uh, around the volcano, the volcano subsides, and you end up with this beautiful coral dynamic landscape that is inhabitable in many ways, has an incredible geography, an incredible biology, an incredible vegetative history. Um, but you notice that the steep sides of those atolls, they go down for thousands and thousands of feet into the sea. And um, I want to just hold that as a placeholder. It's wonderful when you get to an atoll like Utirik, where you can actually use available charts and you can find a gap in the, in the, uh, 
in the atoll to get yourself into the lagoon, and that's in fact what we did. And this is one of the only truly inhabited atolls, and I was so excited to be there because instead of Ford Fiestas, they have Marshallese sailing canoes, which are the most elegant sailing vessels I have ever encountered. But uh, this is us coming ashore um, in that nasty little dinghy. Um, you don't want to swim too far even in the lagoons because uh, the whole of the Marshall Islands is a sh shark san sanctuary. Um, yeah, so there's that to, to cope with. But uh, Donko was like the Pied Piper anyway. He's a very engaging chap. And, uh, but as soon as he would pull his drone out, and for those of you, I guess anybody who's in the field anymore has a drone, but Trevor Wallace, can you imagine trying to land a drone when you're surrounded by 40 children going, <laughs> um, but anyway, the Pied Piper with his drone um, uh, led, this, uh, led this team, and we, uh, we did our best to gather, we had a 3D mapping capability, and we just, uh, it was, in some ways, it's not sal salvage work, but it's work that really needs to be done to help the Marshallese understand and plot a future course in the circumstances where they are. I didn't really appreciate I knew about the maps of the Marshallese navigators that tell you about the waves and the, the ways in which the waves interact with the various atolls, but the, the depth of navigational knowledge that predates the evolution of the magnetic compass, I mean, it's, it's, it's stunning what the Marshallese know about it. And so I went to, to learn as much as I could. interested in naval architecture. Can you hear me? It has an asymmetric hull. You always uh, keep <laughs> the outrigger to windward, which means that you need to be able to shift the mast. You, be, you, you actually go in both directions, and uh, incredible. I think the impression on every single atoll, and we're talking about atolls, these are proverbially the middle of nowhere. There are no airplanes overhead. There are no ships anywhere nearby. But you walk through the flotsam of humanity. Every single thing that you can imagine, from car parts to frigid, to appliances, to clothing, to footwear, to uh, building materials on the shore. That's about an hour of just just picking up stuff and seeing what's there. We are, uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, and so if you've seen Castaway, remember Wilson? <laughs> I met all Wilson's cousins. Narco, uh, well, there's Narco Thunder. Yeah, yeah, anyway, on we go. Remember the uh, picture of the atoll with its deep sides? Well, it turns out that Bocock, the most northerly atoll, and it was cool because any Marshallese we ran into, they said, you went, where? <laughs> Bocock? Really? You know, you can't get into the lagoon in Bocock. They all know that. And, of course, what we did happened to get there on a lucky day. There's Cal Captain Elmy. We were able to get onto the atoll. If somehow it just... We just got onto the atoll, tide, wind, stuff. We just thought, oh, cool. We took our little dinghy. Everybody gets off. We were on the atoll for uh, four days doing what we were doing. When it came time to get off, <laughs> it, uh, it was a whole different story. I just want to show you this because the interaction between the atoll, this is not academic knowledge, the hydraulics that are coming up from somewhere deep down with uh, Poseidon or whoever's down there, uh, 
So these are two, this is Rakimi and March, two of the crew members. I was off this by this time, but that's right at the edge where all that froth is. So they're just paddling in and all's going well. There they are, yeah. And all of a sudden a swell comes up behind them which is interacting with something coming up from below. And uh, yeah, there and this happened. And here's the next picture in the series. <laughs> The lads are somewhere down below getting their knees and elbows scraped to snot by the coral. And, of course, they're thinking about all kinds of cool stuff, including uh, the other things that are fishing in that general vicinity. Um, yeah, uh, where am I going? West. Uh, yes. Good question. Yeah, we started with 11 and we had just a, just a 11 left at the end, which was happy. Um, we went west and um, this is an incredible story. And as a Canadian uh, standing in the United States talking about this, uh, I, I feel a little bit uh, Canadians aren't holy about anything. And, uh, but I will say that... Um, the effects of the testing that happened after the Second World War live, live large. People cannot live on Bikini Atoll. People, they can't live on Rongelap. They can't live on uh, Rongrik. And um, the circumstances of this situation, you can't eat the fish in this area. There are beautiful land crabs. You can't eat those. The crew eat, ate those. And there's this strange village built by the U.S. Department of Energy that's, that's empty including a church. And uh, <clears throat> I gave, uh, I was inspired. There were, uh, I thought, well, I better give a sermon on what was in my heart uh, to, an, to my imagined parishioners. But then I realized that whoever had been there as a preacher had left not one jacket, but three for all eventualities. <clears throat> and that left me as a cultural anthropologist um, with my head spinning. Yeah. Uh, we actually did swim in the in the crater of uh, Castle Bravo, um, which was it sort of brings it all home. And um, we uh, we ate rice off a 12 foot slate pool table from the Up and Adam Cafe that was on uh, Bikini. It's a good purpose for it, I guess. Good sturdy table for the rice cookers. And yeah, we paddled out in our little inflatable kayaks and tied ourselves to those and. We were actually kind of having fun at the edge of the crater. Um, it's a weird feeling, but um, I was doing really well till Matt, the environmental chemist, we all came up for a breath and he said, did you have any idea that there were six sharks right behind you? And I said, no, uh, but uh, I think we should probably get back in the kayaks now. Um, but the work, uh, there are some people, this is Fred Angela, who is a, is a keeper uh, of Bikini, and he's waiting for the day when he can bring his people back. But he's actually describing to Danko about his grandfather. Now, the navigational knowledge we learned used to be in families. And if you were part of that family, you got the knowledge of how it worked. But this guy's grandfather decided that it was time to bring that every, all of the knowledge keepers together, and they created a school in Rangarik. And in that school, he's describing this to, to Donko, the final exam was a circumstance in which you imagine yourself as, you know, final exam day. They blindfold you. They put you on the bottom of a canoe, put a tarp over the canoe, and take you to a very particular place, and you have to tell them where it is. Why only the feel fascinating. My interest in this is to take 40 years of learning about response to change, cultural change, climate change in the Arctic to the Marshall Islands and to, to try to bring those together. And um, that's uh, an ongoing project. And in fact, uh, on the way here, this is my first post-pandemic uh, foray. I've just come from uh, Springdale, Arkansas. Uh, on the Okeanos, we used to, we had, when we did have chicken, we got what were called miscut wings. 
which was if you chopped every joint out of a chicken and packaged it up, that's what miscut wings were. And I thought it was really ironic that under the the uh, compact of free association which Marshallese have with the USA, they can actually come here without a visa by way of, oops, we're sorry, we blew up your home atoll. Um, but there are 20,000 Marshallese in Springdale, Arkansas, and what they're doing is working for Tyson Chicken. And it, it's and I was just there uh, talking to the, some of the Marshallese youth that were there, and that's where my research has taken me. It's fascinating. This new work that I'm doing based on this, I mean, the atlas is ongoing, but it's actually looking at the notion of migration and climate change, and uh, that's bringing Arctic and, and non-Arctic together. But I just want to finish by saying that uh, what a pleasure and what a So it's April 12th. I think it's uh, day 17 of this uh, cartographic adventure in map ground zero in the Marshall Islands. I'm uh, delighted to be traveling with the Explorers Club flag number 73. This already significant expedition is somehow enhanced by the fact that we, we have the Explorers Club with us. But what a treat it is to know that, uh, that this flag began life in 1937 on uh, an Explorers Club expedition to Lapland. We are in the Central Pacific, uh, flying the flag here. To our friends at the, uh, the Explorers Club, it really is special to know that uh, exploration as reflected in the Explorers Club is uh, along with the journey on this uh, adventure called Okeanos uh, Mapping Ground Zero. A lot of really exciting things are being done by our members. That was great, James. Thank you. And last but not least is archaeologist extraordinaire, extraordinaire Gino um, Caspari. And Dr. Caspari is an archaeologist and explorer. He's known for his work in Siberia excavating one of the oldest royal Scythian tombs and his um, development of remote sensing applications in archaeology. He's built a Swiss nonprofit foundation supporting archaeological field research in remote corners of the globe and currently serves as the CEO of GeoInsight, a startup focusing on geospatial data integration and machine learning. He carried flag number 134 on an expedition to the Norwegian Arctic. Uh, the island of Svalbard has seen a staggering uh, melt of its ice patches and had never been before um, covered by intensive archaeological surveys. So I'm looking forward to hearing about this. Thanks. Are we getting a picture? <laughs> so maybe I'll start um, talking a little bit, uh, as most of you and know about my work in Siberia, working with frozen tombs of the Iron Age, uh, and working in Russia has never been an easy feat, really. Uh, and as all of you, uh, we've gone through a very difficult period in the past two years. We kept the project afloat, um, reducing its size and its scope, doing preparatory surveys and small-scale excavations, but as you all know, the geopolitical events um, made this unfortunately currently impossible to continue. But as explorers, we're adaptable, and we have this amazing community here uh, that actually reduced the setup time for expeditions by a large amount. Usually, if you go out on an archaeological excavation, excavation or expedition, it takes you years to form the contacts and set things up. Uh, 
Now, uh, knowing our very active Norwegian chapter and having been in touch with them for a long time, it was relatively easy uh, to find a new spot to do some exciting research on because, um, well, I was blocked from my usual spots and um, uh, I wanted to start a new corporation that was mostly club-based. So, um, climate change has not only a terrible impact uh, on the natural environment, but it is also impacting archaeology quite a bit. In particular, there's a lot of uh, glacial sites that are currently melting that have really well-preserved organics, organic materials uh, dating back the way to um, the Bronze Age and even further, maybe most famously, Utsi the Iceman. Uh, so we have glacial archaeological sites in the Swiss Alps, and we have a lot of them uh, in southern Norway. Uh, here some finds by my wonderful Norwegian colleagues who have been doing work in the area for years now. And they are finding perfectly preserved arrows from the Iron Age, still with the fletching on it, with the sinew on it, and plenty of really interesting artifacts, uh, because for archaeologists, uh, organic preservation always is something very exciting because these things usually are not preserved. We're working with bones and stones. Uh, but when you have wood, when you have feathers and leather uh, and felt, uh, this completes the picture that we create of the past by quite a bit. Now, uh, Norway is a very outstretched country and it's very long, and when you feel you're up there, it still goes on. <laughs> so there are actually plenty of sites uh, up there that have never been surveyed, and um, as you see, the melt is quite staggering. So on the upper right-hand side, we have a map uh, from the late 19th century, where you clearly see uh, two substantial glaciers on the island of Ceyland. And um, at the bottom, you see what the condition is today. So um, by now, you really don't need to be a climate scientist to understand that the Arctic is warming, and it's warming very quickly. Now, having a background in remote sensing, um, of course, uh, Remote sensing data is the first thing I look at uh, as a preparation uh, for an archaeological field survey. And um, the beautiful thing in Europe is that you generally have pretty good coverage of data that I don't get uh, in the areas that I usually work in. So um, here I had the luxury of actually having complete coverage uh, of LIDAR, which makes it uh, quite easy to identify uh, archaeological structures all over the island. And so we are finding pit houses, we are finding Neolithic villages, uh, we are finding small pits that uh, were used as hunter hides, and all of that even before setting foot into the place. Well, of course, this being the Arctic, uh, weather conditions are largely unpredictable, and uh, even during the best season of the year, uh, it can be kind of harsh. We have very narrow fjords uh, being on the uh, sea with a sailboat. Uh, we have these nasty fall winds that almost made us lose our rubber dinghy. Uh, fortunately enough, we had good uh, Hansen protection suits um, that make you stay afloat more or less alive uh, for about six hours should you fall into the water. Now, uh, for a good intensive archaeological survey, there's first and foremost one precondition, which means you can actually see something. Um, that was a bit of an issue uh, going up uh, on these mountains because, well, at the sea level, you have reasonably comfortable temperatures, but as you move up, uh, you're very quickly getting into areas where 
the temperature isn't quite as nice. You have frequent whiteouts, and um, uh, the weather changes uh, literally every five to ten minutes. Now, unfortunately, uh, we had uh, set our period a little bit too late. Uh, what you usually want to have for surveying ice patches is peak melt. So you want to have a longer stretch of time where you actually had high temperatures. So new stuff can melt out of the ice, which you then have to collect and bring back to uh, the local authorities, the museums and the universities. And that is usually the case in late August. Now, we went out in late August, but uh, very unfortunately, so we had um, <laughs> a relatively early snowfall. And that makes uh, archaeological surveying uh, essentially impossible, especially when it comes to small artifacts in the area. So um, we therefore uh, refocused uh, our objectives of the survey a little bit. We identified several rock shelters and we were looking for rock art. The very interesting thing about rock art up there is that usually we have a very hard time dating rock art because there's no organic residues that you could do C14 dating on. Of course, you can work through stylistics, but you don't have um, sort of an absolute dating method for rock art. Now, uh, what I learned up there and what was fascinating to me, because uh, I've always worked in Central Asia where we don't have the same conditions, is that you can actually uh, date the rock art based on their position via the sea level. Because once the ice withdrew, the land was rising. And so the oldest rock art is actually at the top. And they were usually creating these at the shore line and as the land was moving up, uh, you get younger and younger rock art that is right at the seaside, which is quite fascinating to me. And we have, of course, on top of everything, we have these beautiful depictions of moose and people going all out in small boats, uh, uh, catching gigantic halibuts. And uh, so it, it's quite a fabulous world out there. Now, we also found this type of site, uh, which is not really possible to detect from LIDAR because um, it's kind of hidden and it looks like a pile of rocks, um, like many sites, in fact, do up there. <laughs> so some are just uh, easier to find because uh, they actually show a shape in the remote sensing data. And so this is a new type of site that we had no idea what it dated. And uh, we were actually able to conduct small excavations and this is uh, a very high pass uh, up on Ceyland. Our boat is somewhere uh, on the left side where we've been anchoring in this narrow fjord and uh, it is a rock shelter on this pass where weather is quickly changing and it's been in use since the 16th century. It actually served us quite well in these conditions. Now uh, when you are up there and uh, you see the rock art and you see these tiny boats and you see the weather conditions in the best time of the year, you really wonder what brought people up there. In the Neolithic, right? Uh, so 5,000 years ago, <laughs> people are up there and they're not just getting by, they're thriving. Um, and uh, you ask yourself that question until uh, you put a bait into the water. It takes you literally 10 minutes to feed your entire family for a week. How is that compared to like a 40, 50 hour work week, right? So I really want to take a second to thank my Norwegian colleagues, Norwegian archaeologists and the Norwegian chapter in particular for their hospitality and their flexibility in planning this expedition during administratively very difficult times. And uh, we will definitely be out there again. And uh, it's going to be exciting. But there's some things that I cannot quite reveal yet. <laughs>
thank you all. That was our flag returns. And now uh, Trevor um, will take you to the next set of amazing presentations. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it's so, yeah, this has all been so surreal because there's been so many things like fomenting after the few years, and so it's like to put a face to the name is awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be mostly presenting, uh, well, because in addition to like my own work, I'm the VP of research and, and all the grants and stuff, so I'm going to be supporting them and elevating all our grantees more than more than talking about my own stuff but um yeah it's super exciting i just hope to keep people it's like you know i think everybody's sort of running on fumes and you get a lot of these presentations so i hope we can like keep the energy going <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we're really in need of now are qualified reviewers. Um, we just finished the cycle, um, and it was just like, I think some people just have some Zoom fatigue and, like, just so much desk work that we had a lot of reviewers drop out last minute. So I'm trying to put together a roster and committee members for, uh, for the following year. Let me, let me grab, do you have a contact just to, just to remind me? No problem. Yeah, I just, I just wanna, um, yeah, I just wanted to, like, I always go through the cards and then I'm all able to follow up and just so I kind of remember it so it doesn't go into the blur. Um, thanks, Jocelyn. How are you? Yeah. Okay. But I do need to update you. Yes. What's uh? Nice job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Question. Uh, the program says you talk.
Okay, so we're, we're going to uh, let people start to file in. Please grab hydration. It's going to be a long day, a lot of really amazing presentations, but we want to make sure everyone's stretched and watered and all of the above. And we'll ring the bell in a few minutes. Amanda first, no? Oh, I thought we were on Rolex. Oh, yeah, yeah. Alfredo? Alfredo. And then once he's done, thank you, thank you, on the Natalie. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And then you're going to intro with Mel Raven. Mm -hmm. uh, again, no video, so uh, just be aware of that. And then intro with Mai. Mm -hmm. And then I will do the quick info session. I'll try Great. to keep it really quick. People don't really want to see you boring stuff right now. Um, but we'll go through that. And then Phil Stevenson, video. Cool. Um, yeah, or, or, or Eugene will be here. So okay. I'll, 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 I'll intro Eugene, and then in, Eugene will intro that. Oh, and great. Then, okay. And then, um, and then intro to Discovery. Mm -hmm. We'll play the sizzle. Mm -hmm. um, and then intro to Peter. And okay. so final, Exodus, Up and Coming, Soon. Um, and then we'll do a brief Q&A. I'll let you decide when to put that off. Um, <laughs> and I'll still moderate. Oh, let me go tell them. Right on time. <laughs> Great to see you. Oh, yeah. It's always like this. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, let me just pull it up. Yep. Yep. Um, just, what is the... Oh, I want the final list. Yeah. Oh, no, they will be. We'll get them by Ocean's Week, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, one I know is in Boston, so, easy one, yeah, other one Indonesia, so I don't know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah,
All right, everybody, I think we're going to get started. So uh, if we could grab our seats. There's some seats like back in the back in the corner here as well. We could just fill in. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, but I will introduce myself. My name is Trevor Wallace. I'm the Vice President of Research and Education at the club. Um, I have been honored to do this position for the past three odd years, uh, mostly during the pandemic. Um, and so it's been, it's been an interesting ride. Uh, during this time, we have increased our grant funding by nearly tenfold. So, yeah, round of applause for um, this, this. This goes out to our sponsors, and this goes out to, to everyone who has helped with the program to grow. Um, it's not easy with a, a group of volunteers and a small staff uh, to accomplish that, but over the past year working uh, on workshops, we find ourselves among uh, NSF uh, funders and Renner Gren and National Geographic in the, the levels of seven-figure funding, so I think that's a huge step for the club. Um, but among these big numbers, uh, I think one thing to remember is the, the individual impact that each one of these grants make and how it can really change the trajectory of someone's career and, in fact, their life. Uh, and on a personal note, I feel like for me as a former grantee, it absolutely changed my life. I found uh, a family of explorers uh, and possibilities I never thought would ever happen. Uh, growing up with a single disabled mom I was mentioning earlier at the annual meeting, I didn't think these things were in the cards for me. Uh, I thought that, you know, you might have to be maybe Jeff Bezos or uh, <laughs> Victor Vescovo to fund these big things, but really um, you just have to have a dream and a group of people who believe in you and a group like the Explorers Club uh, to support these projects. So um, I'll keep the rest of my comments relatively short because we have some incredible grantees uh, that I'll be introducing. Um, we're going to play a video um, that uh, has a, uh, a lot of images from all around the world and all of our seven different programs that we'll learn more about. So without further ado.
So raise your hand. Oh, is this on? Uh, raise your hand if in the past few years, if you had a project or an expedition uh, postponed or delayed. So I, I think that's a, that's a common theme, but the flip side of that is that we have a tremendous amount of perseverance, persistence, endurance, and maybe it's a less popular cousin, patience, uh, among this crowd. Uh, I remember when I first saw uh, Amanda Vicente's uh, application for the symposium we were going to do in 2019, and I was just, I was blown away. She was talking about surveying 16 different caves, wet caves, uh, dry caves, spending the overnights uh, carrying super heavy nitrogen tanks um, with a mostly female team just way out there collecting uh, field data uh, about bats. Um, coming from Costa Rica, uh, I just really wanted to get her to the club. I really wanted to uh, make her part of this, this community of grantees and explorers. Uh, and I, I'm really happy that, yeah, we could make our commitment strong even after two years. We can wait we, because everyone uh, continued forward doing their projects uh, that we can have her here today to present to you. Too short. <laughs> Buenas tardes. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I, I'm going to be presenting part of my dissertation research, a research that was funded and made possible uh, by the Explorers Club. So I'm here to report back. Do I have, do I have the clicker? Let's see how it works. Okay. Okay, so this is a picture that I took from a, um, a national park in Costa Rica. And this is how it's looking in most of the places now. We're displaced in the forest, and now we have a lot of fragmented areas like this. And what we know is that um, this type of disturbance has been associated with biodiversity loss. And more recently, we have seen associations as well with increased risk of emerging infection diseases. But we don't really understand the direction, or the, we cannot really predict the direction or the magnitude, and we don't really understand the mechanism behind this. What we do know is that anthropogenic disturbance can alter disease dynamics in two main ways. So we could have some effects on population densities, or we could also affect some traits of the species that persist there. So if we think of the densities, for example, we could have uh, different uh, communities assemblages. So each of these columns would be a community. And what we, we, what we have seen is that sometimes this, these assemblages that happen with uh, habitat fragmentation are not random. So they are kind of deterministic. There are some species, like this yellow one here, which could be more vulnerable to change, and we lose them more easily. While we could have a species like this blue one here, which could persist even in degraded habitats and even thrive in those environments. So the interesting thing here is that sometimes this extirpation risk is also associated with how well they uh, get infected and transmit the diseases to other individuals. So. Interestingly, this uh, blue species is also really good. It ha is, is highly competent transmitting that disease. So what we end up having is that these low uh, diversity communities have higher prevalence of diseases, while these higher um, these communities with more species tend to dilute the effect of these uh, blue species here. So this seems to be like a win-win situation, right? Because we would be expecting to be protecting the forest, not just because it's pretty and we're all conservationists, but we're also trying to say to the public, hey, this is also a public health issue and we should be protecting the forest. The thing is, <laughs> nothing in biology is that simple. So uh, actually, this host competence is not really something that is completely fixed. We know, for example, that the habitat degradation, besides having some impacts on communities' assemblages, 
also have some impact on their immune system. For instance, there's, this, this is an example from Jason Rohr where he showed how pesticides, that is another type of disturbance, also erodes this amphibian capacity to um, fight back a trematode, which causes this really evident limb mal malformations. So this is where my thesis kind of this is the theoretical framework of my thesis where I'm trying to disentangle these two because uh, so anthropogenic disturbance could have some these two impacts and they could happen simultaneously. So it's really hard to decouple those two to actually understand the mechanism. So this, now let's get into the interesting part because I'm a bat specialist and I really like um, to talk about bats. So if you wanna talk about bats later, you just contact me. Um, but well, they have been in the, in the center of many of these um, kind of high profile emerging diseases. More recently, the SARS-like viruses. And a lot of people ask, what makes that so special? And I, I mean, I, I could answer this in many, many ways, but, um, but in terms of my research, what is interesting is that they are really highly diverse. So they could adapt to different changing habitats, they have different niches, so it's not just diverse in terms of how many species they are, but also like their ecological niche that they um, have. So for, oh, sorry. So for instance, so for instance, you could have like fruit eating bats, nectar eating bats, blood eating bats, uh, insect eating bats, which also provides a lot of ecosystem services to us. But in terms of adapting or, or responding to environmental changes, that's really important for me as well because I could study how they could have a differential response to that environment. So to give you an example, in here I am showing you a, a common vampire bat which has been greatly benefiting from the changes of a forest to um, the extension of cattle re rearing because you know, they know exactly where to go every night and they have an open buffet of cow every, every night. Um, on the other hand, you have here a frog eating bat that really relies on this type of forest to, to find its prey. So of course you would expect that some species might be benefiting from those changes while other ones will be um, having some detrimental effects. So now, what people sometimes not consider is their roosting sites. So this is where bats spend more than 50% of their lives. And um, this is where they interact and socialize with other species and with common specifics. So it increases the chances of pathogen transmission, which is important for the type of study that I'm doing. And this is also a place where human disturbance could be an inescapable physiological stressor. So this is why this is a really great study system to, to try to do this type of, of um, analysis. So uh, the aim of my research was to assess how habitat was um, having some impact in this community assemblage and at the same time on those uh, species health and eventually in, in downstream effects on disease dynamics. So what I did was basically after many, many expeditions, I ended up picking uh, just 16 caves. There are many more in Costa Rica, but I was trying to find some sort of, at first, you know, I, ca I cannot go to all these caves as much as I wanted to, um, but also I wanted to, them to be in like this environmental gradient. So some of them were in highly degraded habitats and some of them were located in pristine forests where there's national parks. And I did this sampling over the dry and the wet season. Uh, the interesting thing here is that, as I mentioned before, usually, um, disturbance and biodiversity loss happen together, but in this case, and this is why caves provide such a good opportunity, we could have caves that are in really degraded habitats and you have a lot of species and also caves with just two species in, in pristine forests. So that gave us the opportunity to decouple those two. 
So what I did is, uh, besides going inside of a cave and taking some measurements, I also uh, counted the bats and I identified them to the species level. And uh, just to know who were there and which one were the more common ones. I uh, also collected samples for many of them. So we capture, we aim to capture at least 10 individuals for each of the species that we found there. We ended up having over 1,300 individuals captured from 17 different bat species from which I took um, measurements. I also took urine, fecal, uh, blood samples. And I then took all of these to the lab where I did a screening for four different pathogens because I wanted to see there are different pathogens that have different uh, way um, of transmission. They also lead to different immune responses. So I wanted to see if these different pathogens have a, a similar pattern to these uh, disease dynamics. At the same time, I also measure some immune markers, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. I could talk about that later if you, all, if you want. Um, and this is a really messy graph, but I just wanted to show you part of the important things here. So for instance, what is really important, and this is in a conservation aspect, is that case complexity, but not a habitat degradation, had an effect of species assemblages. So it's, they uh, persist, these diverse communities persist in degraded habitats. But it seems that this habitat um, degradation does have an effect on population sizes. So we end up having population declines in these perturbed environments, which could be a warning sign of uh, population declines to come. And the other thing that is interesting is that each of these pathogens had different responses to uh, density, habitat, case complexity, and richness, saying that there are really more complex patterns that previously known. So those are kind of the main conclusions in terms of, of um, caves being such an important uh, site to conserve for, for bats because they're well, they provide, they could subsidize these big populations of bats that provide us with a lot of ecosystem services. And at the same time, there should be more studies in disease ecology in these sites because this is exactly where they're interacting the most and where uh, basically they would stay there even when the environment is being degraded. So with that, I would just like to acknowledge a lot of people that helped me in the field or in the lab, and uh, of course, all the funding sources as well. So uh, is there a second mic? So maybe we could have a question or two for Amanda. So I did want to mention as well that Amanda comes from our uh, Exploration Fund uh, grant, which is one of our oldest grants. Uh, you know, the legacy of that being uh, Richard Leakey was one of those grantees way back in the day, Jared Diamond. We have uh, many years of grantees that uh, now we have the next future scientists doing this incredible work. So, uh, yeah, if you want to raise your hand, if anybody has a question. Congratulations, Amanda. That was terrific. Thank uh, you. One uh, question in view of COVID and its transmission from animal species to humans. Are the bacteria, Legionella, spirochetes, et cetera, transmissible to humans, and or are they transmissible to other bats? What was your conclusions? Yeah. So, that's they could have many, many bacteria that only circulate within the bat populations. Um, but there has, there has been many zoonotic uh, situations of these bacteria in, in humans. There have been like few outbreaks events um, or zoonotic events. Um, however, it's not something that has caught a lot of attention. Like it's one of those neglected tropical diseases, so I, we don't really know much, and we don't know how much of it is under the radar. 
because they all kind of have this category of being like a febrile illness that could be dengue, it could be, you know, anything. So we don't really know or have the capacity to be testing all these, you know, situations. So, yeah, it's, it's very unknown. Uh, do you have, have you noticed any of the, what is it called, the white nose? Um, diseases in Costa Rica or is it just more of a northern? Yeah, it's so the white nose syndrome is um, mostly here in Canada and North America um, in the U.S. Um, but that's because bats there hibernate and what happens there is that they arose more frequently than they should so they basically burn out their fat, their body fat and they cannot make it through the winter. The good thing about the tropics is its weather. <laughs> So they don't have to hibernate there. So even if there's uh, the fungi is there, it's not really causing that disease as the one we see in these temperate zones. Mm -hmm. how, how did you keep your team safe from the pathogens that you were exploring and uh, make sure that your field work did not bring home more casualties than it should? Yeah, that's a good question, and I think people are now more conscious about that. Um, in the neotropics, there's no, besides histoplasmosis, which is a, a fungi that could, you know, get into your lung, there's not known disease that you could get through getting into caves. Bats are known to also transmit rabies, so everyone in my team has to be vaccinated against rabies because it has a 100 fatality rate but there is a vaccine, so we could protect ourselves with that. We, you also have to be trained of how to handle bats because of, you know, you have to protect yourself, but also protect the bats because you could easily hurt them. Um, not taking things home, like not taking, uh, or contaminated other, other caves is also really important. So we sterilize our clothes, we, we uh, use the same clothes to go to the same caves um, so we don't we don't do this transmission from one you know pathogens from one place to the other, and of course you know PPE the basic PPE that's what we use. So we haven't had anything to worry about, luckily. Yeah. Another round of applause for Amanda. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, um, I'm going to be acknowledging our sponsored grants, uh, starting out with the, the Rolex grants, which are actually our longest standing part, uh, partner. And aside from making nice timepieces that you might be familiar with that you may not think you want to bring all around the world in some of these remote places, uh, they're actually pretty hardy and they uh, support, basically you read the mission statement and it's very similar uh, to the Explorers Club mission statement furthering field science around the world, pushing the limits. Uh, many early Ro Rolex uh, awardees were going deep beneath the oceans and all around the world. If you go downstairs, you'll see the, the Rolex watch program it is similar to our flags. Uh, there's three different watches, a submariner watch uh, that has gone with uh, uh, Denea Buckingham and both Callie Bielenter who are in the crowd. Uh, another watch that uh, Dr. Kaspari and I took to Siberia, got a little mud on it. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful partnership that we have, um, and uh, I want to introduce our, our next grantee, uh, Alfredo Purali, uh, who is one of our Rolex grantees. Um, I like to think of him as the, the Ansel Adams of the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, he creates beautiful imagery. He just uh, showed me a, a book that he produced um, that I couldn't stop pouring over. There were so many great conversations, and I would just steal away uh, to look at this beautiful book. He's a photographer, filmmaker, explorer in uh, cold uh, parts of Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego uh, down south. And uh, without further ado, we have Alfredo. Thanks for the introduction, Trevor. Uh, it's a huge honor to be here today. Um, I feel very lucky to be one of the Rolex Explorers grantee. It definitely it's taking my career to places that I can't even imagine. I'm very grateful of the club and all the people that makes this possible. 
thanks to Trevor Wallace, to Emerald Nash, and I especially want to, I especially appreciate uh, the kindness of Milby Polk that introduced me uh, to the club and opened the door for me to the club. Um, I also uh, want to thank uh, Rolex to support uh, the club uh, program, grants program, and also all the sponsors that make uh, our project possible, such as Fjall Raven, Leica. Uh, so thanks to all of them. Sorry, this I forgot to. <laughs> Sorry. Oops, there it is. Sorry. Um, well, so I'm not here because I'm a good speaker. I'm here because of my work. I'm a documentary filmmaker and photographer. Uh, the last decade I have been working in Tierra del Fuego, uh, the southern region of Patagonia, next to Cape Horn. Uh, and my work is related with conservation, ethnography, social issues, climate change, and of course, exploration. And what brings me here today is ICE Postcard Project, which is a long-term project where we document and explore the retreat of the glaciers in Tierra del Fuego through comparative photos taken in the same location after a century. We rescue the legacy of all explorers and we use their archival photos to go to the same location a century later and recreate the same frame. These images uh, make us witness of what's going on today and show us that climate change is real and it's super tangible. In 2000. 17, I invited Cristian Donoso, a Rolex Laureate explorer, Chilean explorer, and also a club member. Uh, and we started the project with a 12-day expedition to Cordillera Darwin. And we were published in the Explorer's Journal magazine. Later on, in 2020, I was granted by the club with the Rolex, with the Rolex grant. And we went back to Tierra del Fuego to keep documenting the retreatment of the glaciers. So let's travel to Tierra del Fuego and understand how this expedition was, and please enjoy the video. Estamos en Tierra del Fuego, una de las zonas más remotas de la Patagonia. Llevamos ya tres semanas de exploración aquí, eh, con una misión en específica, retratar las mismas fotografías que capturaron antiguos exploradores hace más de un siglo. También ha sido una tremenda experiencia ir detrás, tras los pasos de estos exploradores, de Alberto Agostini y Gunther Pujol y ir de alguna manera sintiéndose identificado con esta emoción frente a la naturaleza. Me fui cautivando por libros, por historias que escuchaba y simplemente por ver un mapa, por ver un mapa y ver estas figuras de islas tan fragmentadas, tan extrañas, con tanto rincón, tanto recoveco por, por descubrir, se me implantó como esa idea y casi esa necesidad de poder llegar a estos lugares. Todos vamos detrás de la felicidad y administramos nuestras vidas de, de la mejor forma para poder ir hacia eso que idealizamos como el lugar. 
lugar de nuestra felicidad. Y para mí la felicidad está asociada también con la exploración. Siempre quiero conocer más, siempre quiero ir más allá de donde alcanza mi vista. Quiero ver qué hay arriba y a medida que voy entrando, eh, mi deseo, mi hambre por conocer más de ese territorio va aumentando. Oscar, Oscar, eh, muere un poco más adelante, por favor, y también un poco más, unos 50 metros hacia el centro del fiordo. Ahora acércate a los islotes, en la misma posición, viniendo en línea recta hacia nosotros. Cambio. La naturaleza experimenta una transformación a veces abismante, como es el caso del retroceso de los glaciares, y en otros casos cómo esa naturaleza logra permanecer casi estática a lo largo de un siglo. Utilizar eh, archivo fotográfico que data hace más de un siglo es abrir una puerta, una ventana, para poder observar cómo eran estos territorios en aquel entonces. I was born in Chile, uh, that thin and large country in South America, and since school, as, as, as I said in the video, I was fascinated by the thousands of islands that create that region that some people call the end of the world. If you look carefully to the map, you can see a massive ecosystem, a massive fjord ecosystem full of mountains, glaciers, and wild landscapes. And that's Tierra del Fuego. The project included a relevant research in terms of photo archive. We went through more than 10,000 photos in order to find those most um, significant for our purpose. This is Alberto Agostini. He was a priest, an explorer, Italian priest. He spent most of his life working in, in Patagonia, and he, um, pr he, has pr he produced one of the most relevant documentation on the area ever. And we use most, most of the photos we use in this project are from him. And this is Gunter Pluscho. He is a German explorer, and he was the first person to fly over Cordillera Darwin and Tierra del Fuego. So, He was the first person to show us how these land landscapes look at from above. We tried to do um, the most self-efficient expedition as we could. We um, included a fast sailboat uh, to move from Punta Arenas uh, to Tierra del Fuego. And then uh, we use uh, sea kayaking uh, exploration to approach to, to the different spots that we need to go. And of course, afterwards, we needed to walk uh, plenty of time to find uh, where these guys took those photos a uh, time ago. So 
So we use um, the archive photos as a GPS, and they helped us to, to find the places we were looking for. But sometimes that was pretty hard. And as you can look there, uh, the tracks sometimes looks messy as that, and we spent the whole day walking around trying to, to reach to the same spot, and, so, and sometimes even we, we didn't find the photos. These are other uh, photos we took during the expedition. That's Chaparelli Glacier. This was taken by Gunter Pluscio. We saw it on the video. It doesn't, we tried to put a kayak down there. It doesn't, it looks very well here, but. <laughs> and well, this photo is relevant because that's Marinelli Glacier. Uh, it's one of the biggest one in Tierra del Fuego. And also it, it's, uh, it's one of the glaciers that has retreated the most during the last century. It has retreated almost uh, 12 kilometers during this time. But, as I want to have a positive ending in my lecture, in these comparative photos, we're not only witnessing uh, the retreatment of the glaciers and what, are dis what is disappearing, but also it's nice to see what it remains there. And it's overwhelming to realize how wild this place is. It's crazy to see the same tree in the same spot, the same rock at the same spot, the, lag the small lagoons in the same size. And that's crazy. So the planet will continue with its transformation with or without us, but we can live without nature. We're part of it and we need to keep protecting it so we can see that same tree a century later. And finally, I want to acknowledge the work of my colleagues, explorers, Cristian Donoso, that is a member from the club and co-author of the project, Cristian Donoso, and Oscar Jaures, who is a local explorer from Punta Arenas. So thank you very much, and thank you to the club. So we'll, we'll have time for questions at the end, but we'll take one quick question now for Alfredo, if we have any. We'll keep it moving. Oh, yep, one back there. Yep, we'll, we'll get the microphone over to you. Great job. Yeah, you said uh, you were out there for how long again, and um, what kind of gear did you pack uh, as far as food, as far as uh, I saw, you know, they had the kayaks, but did you bring additional rafting, additional rope, um, rappelling equipment to try to find that one spot? Uh, I'm just curious if you could elaborate on that some. Yeah, of course. Uh, we spent, well, we did two expeditions, one in 2017, and we spent 12 days. On that time, we went on a sailboat. And in 2020, we spent uh, three weeks over there uh, using a fast boat. So we moved really fast from Punta Arenas to Tierra del Fuego. And then we set up like base camps where we leave the boat. And then we start uh, navigating on this sea kayak. And then we start uh, working on different areas. And regarding the equipment, uh, well, uh, a lot of cameras, uh, batteries, solar panel, uh, we, as we have the, the, the fast boat, we had a, um, uh, like an engine so we can charge uh, batteries if the solar panel was off. Um, and regarding the food, well, uh, I don't know in, in English, but avena, uh, a lot of avena, a lot of pasta, uh, really simple. We keep it really simple, uh, energy bars and stuff like that. Yeah, and so if you want to keep talking later, happy. Another round of applause for Alfredo. So I'm going to keep this rolling. It's, it's 
I, I'm not going to throw them under the bus, but this is actually the, the flag presentations went longer. So this is not our fault that we're behind. Um, but I do, and we'll have some, some time for questions at the end. Um, our second uh, Rolex grantee uh, is Natalie Knowles, and she's doing work in the Amazon with uh, Kayapu Shingu, um, doing really groundbreaking work in integrating uh, ecology and guiding. Um, and uh, ecological management in areas where mining and deforestation is basically taking out uh, this amazing resource that not only affects these indigenous people, uh, but all of us uh, as a planet. Uh, so please uh, 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 give a warm welcome uh, to Natalie. Hi, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here and uh, I want to thank the Explorers Club and Rolex for uh, supporting my research and work and I'm, it's been an amazing weekend um, getting to meet so many exciting people who are doing amazing, amazing work. Um, okay, wait a second. All right, so I'm here to talk about the Kaipo project. Um, it's a project I've been a part of for the last five or six years um, down in the Brazilian Amazon, like um, you've just heard. And so um, specifically the project I've been working on is integrating traditional ecological knowledge with conservation technologies to help um, improve the community-based conservation happening uh, with the Kaipo people. And so I'm going to just jump back and give you a bit of context about the Kaipo and um, the situation that this project is centered in, and then we'll jump back into what we're actually doing. So um, Kaipo territory is located in the southeastern part of the Amazon. It's a huge territory, 11 million hectares, so you can see it from space. And that's about the size of a small country like Belgium or South Korea. So it's, it's massive, and as you can see, um, it's on the edge of deforestation. So all of this used to be rainforest, um, and it's been taken over by uh, loggers and miners. And the indigenous territory is exactly what you can see here. And they've done an incredible job protecting it over the last you know, thousands of years. And so this territory is super important. Um, it protects uh, major, major uh, primary forest regeneration, carbon sequestration. Um, it's an important habitat for a number of endangered endemic species. Um, you name it, the Amazon, it exists in their territory, and including so much unknown biodiversity. And these guys have been protecting it for um, their whole existence. And while their uh, territory is protected under constitutional rights, they're really left to their own um, resources to defend it. So they've got the rights, but there's no enforcement happening in the region. It's, it's the Wild West, and um, these guys are a warrior culture, and they've been defending it, you know, in every way that they can. So um, to give you a bit of context on their culture, uh, they were contacted about 40 to 50 years ago. So um, this is our, uh, one of our head field guides, Takak Nyoti. And he grew up uncontacted by Western civilization. So in the past 40 years, they've seen this incredible transformation from living fully isolated lifestyles to, you know, they're seeing technology, they're seeing our culture, they've got cell phones, they're using GPS. It's, it's crazy. And um, it's been a wild, um, a wild 40 years for them. And um, yeah, they've seen a lot in, from pandemics and things Measles and mumps nearly took them out a um, couple hundred or decades ago, and now they're seeing pandemics again, and these just different um, uh, threats that they've been faced with. So they had rubber tappers coming in before, and now, now it's logging and mining and, and cattle. And so um, they've been pretty incredible um, warriors defending their territory, and um, a lot of that's 
really because their culture and their values and the way they see the world is super based in nature. They are part of their ecosystem and their culture is, is part of their environment. And so it's just a natural for them to protect it. Um, they, they don't need incentives. They don't um, yeah, have to be convinced that conservation is a good thing. They uh, innately are connected with the place that they live. And so they yeah, have been um, just been able to, to see that connection really strongly. And so with uh, only a population of about 10,000 people in a territory the size of a small country, they've been able to defend their borders um, and continue to live primarily subsistence lifestyles. Um, they always talk about their word for money is uh, pio capri, which means sad leaves. And they just don't see the need for it because their ecosystem provides everything they need from housing to clothes to food um, and everything to continue their traditional lifestyle. Um, but the threats to their territory are massive. Uh, logging and mining is moving in super fast and uh, driven by our global demands for those products. And uh, it's, it's really detrimental. So this is a closer look at the edge of their territory where gold, gold mining has come in and it's illegal. Um, but once it gets in, it kills the river and everything around it. And um, with that, their traditional lifestyle is gone and their culture is gone because they don't have the food, they don't have um, any of the resources that they need. And so uh, they, it is pretty socially um, destructive to them as well. It leads to um, everything from alcoholism and prostitution to uh, just a whole range of things, health problems and all these things. So keeping their territory um, free from that is really important and it's, but the threats are increasing. So they've got a government that's super, super hostile to indigenous rights. Um, they're trying to, their government, federal government is trying to open up their territory to mining. Um, and right now about 8,000 uh, indigenous people are in Brasilia protesting um, this proposed policy to open up their territory. So, um, so yeah, so what we've been doing is really trying to help them provide the tools and the resources that they need to continue their fight um, in this new context. So giving them the tools, the skills to um, fight in our modern world. So they, you know, they've been faced with all this stuff and they're seeing access to technology and it can be, really be harnessed to continue their mission um, in a new way. And so their next generation is, uh, is really excited about integrating some of these things and they're, they're super interested to learn and their older generation really sees the value in that as well and they understand that if, uh, if their younger generation is gonna be uh, faced with technology and, and have to deal with it, that if it can be harnessed in a way that supports their traditional values and supports their traditional way of living, then it can be this really big win-win situation. Um, and it's really been sort of a part of their culture. That's something they've always done. I think it's why they've defended their territory so so well is that whenever they've met other other cultures, whether it's other indigenous cultures or rubber tappers in the past, they've always had this really great ability to kind of see what other people are doing and see what they can kind of harness for themselves and use in, in, use in their own way. Um, everything from fishing gear to rifles to cameras and social media and um, yeah. So um, our project specifically was uh, dreamed up between these three men and myself. This is Takak Nyori, or Takak Nyoti. He is the elder that was, grew up uncontacted. And these are his two sons, Takak Nyori and Beth Takoti. And so kind of seeing all this and um, the two, these two young men are, were very interested in learning about cameras, learning about technology. We were in there doing um, some environmental assessment work um, to get funding to continue the conservation work. And these guys were all field guides and wanted to learn all about it. And so we realized that if we could uh, teach these guys and kind of do a citizen science approach, then they'd be more autonomous in their own conservation monitoring and continuing to defend their territory. So, um, so yeah, so basically it was a bit of a pyramid scheme and uh, Takak Nyori and Beb Kakoti uh, learned super quickly over the past few years of, um, of being field guides uh, to use the cameras. And from there, they uh, taught 
about 50 young Kaiapo from 11 different villages that we work in. So we work in the northern Jingu. There's 11 communities. And we would have groups of four or five uh, youth from the community come in and do the monitoring with us. And so we would teach, or the two, that Kakoti and Takognori, would teach them to use uh, the cameras. And we had about 30 cameras in the field at a time, rotating, and the uh, groups would would do the monitoring with us and, and learn how to do it so that they've got a group now of about 50 Kaipo who are able to do the conservation monitoring themselves. Um, so yeah, so yeah, basically uh, for this project we had 30 cameras in the field over 60 days um, with groups in there from, for four to five days, uh, rotating where the cameras were, rotating uh, the cards and uh, analyzing what we caught and we caught an incredible range of biodiversity from jaguars to primates to birds and everything in, everything in between. Um, we're still in the process, I don't know if anyone's done camera trapping, but we're still in the process of going through all the photos. So I don't have specific numbers for you, but a ton of endemic and endangered species um, in super high um, occurrence rates. So that's really exciting and information that we can use to uh, push for more uh, support with conservation. Um, and so, yeah, basically every day we would take some of the cards out or switch cards and do um, do some basic analysis and basic uh, organization of the cameras or the photos that we got and videos that we got. And it was really cool. It became a bit of a community event. We were in one of the villages. It was where we were based. And the whole community would come out every night to go through the photos and um, look at them and talk about them. So the then that's what's been really cool with this integrating traditional knowledge and uh, technology is there's so much nuanced data and there's so many stories that come out of it and so you know you have a photo of some species come up um, a monkey that's on the ground and having the whole community talk about why that is and and where that's happening and, and what might have pushed that monkey to go onto the ground when it's a super rare site and things like that where it's um perhaps not the most robust in terms of uh, Western science and documentation um, with camera trapping, but I think there's a ton that can be learned um, by integrating this sort of chaos and inefficiencies that happen when you um, are working with communities. So it's, it's really cool. Um, we would also document everything that we saw on our field days. So we were in the field every single day with the groups um, going to the same or different locations to expand our, our territory that we were monitoring. And so everything from Bushmaster snakes to spider monkeys to uh, peccary, sometimes we'd take those for dinner. But um, yeah, a, t a ton of wildlife and we try and map it and um, include that as well, um, which, was, which was really great. And it's incredible walking in the forest with an indigenous uh, Kaipo guide who has, grew up in the forest and can see spider monkeys from kilometers away and call birds, every bird that you can think of. Um, it's wild, really, really incredible. You see something new every single day you walk, walk in the forest. Um, and so yeah, at the same time, we were always collecting different things for traditional medicines, um, different plant species, and um, which is really, really exciting for the young people that were with us, um, got a chance to talk about that amongst themselves and share that knowledge, which is otherwise being kind of pushed out. Um, the Brazilian culture is generally trying to push them towards Western medicine, implementing nurses and, and things like vaccines, which are great, um, pushing for them to have access to that and, and to get on board with that. But it, their kind of way of doing it is often downplaying the, the benefits of their traditional medicines and stuff. So uh, having the youth in the field and uh, seeing the elders collect things and apply them in real life is, is really, really great. Um, yeah. And yeah, so then um, it, when we're integrating these sort of two different types of knowledge, um, it's yeah, not a, like I said, perhaps some of it's not as robust. You know, traditionally when you, or con contemporary camera trapping techniques would utilize a grid system and um, 
for statistical analysis and things like that, but we really let the indigenous um, elders lead the process. And so um, focusing on areas that they felt were important to them, important for conservation, important for their traditional lifestyles, and what they wanted to get out of it, so what information that they were looking to, to get. And um, it's definitely a different process. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be learned and a lot of, you have to kind of rethink your scientific brain a lot. Um, you know, you're working with a community that uh, doesn't have a written language. So we think, oh, you know, everything needs to be documented and written down and that's not a priority for them, but they can remember where a camera trap is anywhere in the forest. They can, you know, have all these stories for all the, that's a list of all the different species in their native language um, that they've written down. And, you know, we're nitpicky about spelling and things like that. And, you know, it's spelled differently every single time. So you're trying to analyze data with five different spellings of something that doesn't even have a written, written name. So it's uh, definitely can be challenging. Um, but again, a lot of really incredible information comes out of it um, that we wouldn't otherwise get. So this is um, Sakagnoti is drawing a map of the Xingu River, um, you know, based on memory with all these important locations and then tying that map to what our GPS was getting and things like that. We just get a ton more out of it. And um, and I think that's a, it's a thing we're seeing in, in science of letting the indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge lead. There's not really one correct way to understand an ecosystem. They're super complex and chaotic. And um, I think that's, you know, the, the beauty of them. And so kind of embracing that chaos and that, um, yeah, different ways of, of thinking and seeing the um, uh, science behind it and the knowledge. and. Um, so one of the other exciting things was, this is Beth Sakoti, one of our project leads, and he really took on documenting the whole process themselves. And throughout this, they created a documentary film um, that's just internal. So it's just within their communities. And um, each of the youth that were with each group would give an interview and talk about you know, what they've learned and why it's important to protect the forest and what they're doing and how they want to use technology to do that. And so it's super cool and kind of spreading that message and um, building a lot of hype around conservation and their traditional knowledge and also technology, so that, the, which they're really excited about. Um, so that's been a really, really fun component of it. Um, and the communities love it. They get together and watch the, the films that they've made. They pass it around on WhatsApp and it's been um, really amazing. And yeah, so then moving forward, we've left the cameras with them. So they're going to continue um, monitoring species on their own. And again, you know, it's thinking about what's the science for and who's, who's it for. And so, you know, our objective is really getting enough information uh, to make informed decisions. So what data do we need to support the conservation? We know that this region is really important. There's a lot to be learned from it, um, and it's globally essential to uh, biodiversity, to our climate. And so providing, you know, super robust nitty data is not necessarily our priority. It's as much information as we need to convince people to support the conservation, to push out the industries that are causing the harm in the first place and, um, and keeping the communities on board. You know, it's their traditional values and it's their traditional way of life that's kept that area intact and so ensuring that that continues is, is really an essential co component of it. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to seeing what comes out of it and they're using them and however, however they choose to use it. Sometimes it's placing cameras where they've seen a jaguar come and try and take their chickens and so if that's useful then that's great and other times it's at their border where they're documenting and getting photo evidence of um, illegal loggers and miners and fishermen coming in. So lots of uses for technology and um, really great to have the indigenous lead on what decisions are being made and how that information is being used. And yeah, anyways, I could talk about the Kayapo forever. So if you'd love to talk to me about it later, I'd be happy to say more. Thanks.
Uh, a question for Natalie. Yes. Uh, we'll, wait, we'll wait for the, the microphone to get to you. On its way. Thank you. I'm, I'm really anxious to hear some answers about the tattoos. At what age do the people start getting tattoos? Are they influenced by the community they're in or like life situations? Is it art or does the tattoo have a history? Um, all of the above. So it's body paint. It's a stain. So it comes from a Jenny Papo fruit, which is, um, yeah, it kind of stains your skin. So it lasts for about two weeks. Um, yeah, so they're const but they're almost always body painted. They hate being photographed without body paints on. So, um, so whenever we're in the forest with a group with a camera, then they're always body painted. Um, and yeah, the it's a lot of art. There's a lot of creativity. The women do the painting, and um, however they want, they're they're super super creative. And but then there are some traditional painting styles for different life events. So if you've just had a baby, baby the men will get painted fully black. Or if you are a certain age, you might grow into a particular design, which you couldn't have before um, a certain age or life stage. Yeah, so it's constantly constantly changing. But it's, it's a, totally an art form, and the women are really creative. And um, no, it's on men and women, but the women are the ones that do the painting. Yeah. Um, so the face is uh, usually with a, a thin stick, and they they do these super straight lines, um, like geographical designs, and then the body paint is usually done with uh, your hand. So they'll do like lines with a like finger painting kind of thing. Yeah. Another yeah. round of applause for Natalie. So we're gonna we're gonna keep the clip going because we have uh, a lot of other amazing speakers, and then we'll hopefully have some time at the end for more questions. But um, the the next grantee comes from an incredible collaboration that we have from Fjall Raven, um, the outdoor gear and clothing brand that for decades has been creating really great uh, uh, hard weather gear to go into some of the most extreme climates. We saw in Alfredo's. Uh, presentation, a lot of the, the Fjall Raven gear out in the field being used. Um, but our next presenter um, really captured my imagination in something that I never would have thought otherwise, which is so typically Explorers Club. We all have our area of exploration that we love, that we, oh, I explore this, or I'm a researcher of that. Never did I think that I would get so fascinated with leeches. And uh, <laughs> these creepy crawly things are not easy to capture, and, uh, but the, the purpose of doing it is just an incredible way of understanding biodiversity um, in these lost forest fragments in Madagascar. Uh, so please give a warm welcome to my fami, uh, our, uh, ro uh, sorry, pardon me, our Fjall Raven grantee from 2019. Hello, <laughs> thank you all for coming. I'm very excited to be talking to everyone here and finally uh, grateful to have the opportunity to be with everyone in person and share with everyone what I've been working on. Um, no? Okay. <laughs> How many of you have had an encounter with a leech? <laughs> okay, you'll be able to relate to, to what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you Trevor for that introduction and the work that I'm about to tell you a little bit about is the research that I'm doing for my dissertation. Okay, so as you've all learned over this past weekend, or as I'm sure a lot of you already understand, uh, biodiversity or the variety of life on Earth is crucial for many reasons. Um, this variety itself helps maintain 
uh, fresh and uh, fresh water and clean air. Uh, it helps buffer the spread of infectious disease, as we learned from our fellow grantee, Amanda. Um, and uh, additionally, of course, it provides a lot of spiritual and cultural benefits. And so traditionally, when it comes to monitoring this biodiversity, again, as we just learned from Nat's talk, scientists and researchers will often rely on camera traps, uh, which you can see here. Uh, they are strapped to treat uh, a specific species or group of species. And recently, researchers have started playing around with using blood feeding invertebrates, such as flies and mosquitoes, to help uh, monitor this biodiversity by extracting the DNA of their hosts from their guts. And I'm a big fan of the leeches as candidates for this method um, because they are sort of um, more adept at doing this work. They are flightless, so unlike the flies and mosquitoes, you can pretty much trace their blood meals back to the forest from which they were collected. So they're, they provide a site-specific overview of the biodiversity that we're sampling. And this is just to give you an idea of um, this video here, of their size and how they move. They're much smaller than maybe the leeches you've all encountered, <laughs> clearly, um, because they are the terrestrial sort. Um, and I'll get into that a bit in, as we go along. So uh, the leeches that I work on are terrestrial leeches. They're found on land, um, and they're really great for biodiversity monitoring uh, because they're so abundant and so easy to collect. Uh, they are often out collecting you before you realize it. And um, so collecting them is a breeze, I have to say. And as I mentioned before, they are um, site-specific, so they are phylogenetically um, separated by site, which is really useful to give you site-specific information. And they are distributed here. This map just shows you uh, their range. So they're distributed throughout this Indo-Pacific region, um, which harbors some of the world's most endangered species. So everything you see here in red is a biodiversity hotspot, um, an area which simultaneously harbors endangered species and exposes those species to extreme threats. And among the most uh, endangered and among the hottest hotspots is Madagascar, this island off the southeast coast of Africa, where up to 90% of the original forest cover has been lost, where 90% of the species are endemic, meaning they are found nowhere else in the world, and where 90% of those species are relying on this shrinking habitat. So the situation in Madagascar is dire, and um, for that reason, efficient, quick, and broad-scale biodiversity sampling is uh, really urgently needed. And so uh, all these factors together sort of provide the perfect opportunity to uh, test and implement the use of leeches for these biodiversity surveys. So I will just jump right in and give you a little overview of how this is done. Uh, this is a, a photo of me out in the field uh, collecting leeches. Um, as I said, they are terrestrial, uh, so we are usually hiking in the forests in Madagascar, um, and you just have to be very conscious of your clothing. You have to stop every few meters or so, check out your, your clothes, make sure you're collecting everything off of you. We don't collect leeches that have fed on people. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so here are some of my collection tools. We go out and we put them in these little plastic bags until it's time to bring them back to camp and process them and just separate them and sort them into different tubes. And uh, again, here is the collection process. It is uh, quite easy sometimes. There are more leeches They're coming quickly. than I That's can true. handle <laughs> alone. And so I, uh, I take these leeches back to my lab at the Museum of Natural History 
I dissect them for this particular region in um, their posterior crop, which harbors the blood meal. And it's from these tissues that I eventually extract uh, their host DNA. So I'll give you a quick overview of sort of what this genetic pipeline looks like. So once the DNA is extracted from individual leeches, it is pooled um, by uh, locality from where they were collected. And that pool is used as a little template for different genetic regions that we target with PCR. And each one of these targets is um, specifically designed to detect different classes of vertebrates. So we have tetrapod-specific uh, genetic markers, mammal-specific, bird-specific, and uh, reptile-specific. And these bars here represent our DNA sequences that we get back from our analyses. Um, and what happens is uh, we end up deleting a bunch of them because they're too small and they re represent um, contamination. We delete our duplicates and then we cluster them by similarity at 98%. These uh, clusters are then queried through a small curated database to, again, sort through any contamination. And what survives from this small curated database is what is queried against the global genetic database that all scientists contribute their data to, um, and that's known as GenBank. And so from that query, we're able to get our results. Uh, so it's a massive Google search, essentially using genetic sequences and putting them into a database and examining the results that we get. So uh, we have a few uh, different criteria um, as to how we make these identifications of the hosts. And uh, so that was a bit of an overview of the method itself. Now in 2019, I was so honored to be um, funded by Fjell Raven to go on this really special expedition to what was formerly known as the Lost Forest. Of course, we now know that this was only lost to science and has been uh, known to the Malagasy community for generations. Um, and I'll just point your attention to this area that is um, sort of covered in clouds. You'll notice it's the only region uh, in the area where moisture is retained. So this, again, just serves to reinforce the importance of keeping rainforests intact. Again, they maintain and they secure fresh water for all to benefit. Um, and uh, I just also want to acknowledge that we received support and cooperation from the Bara ethnic group. Madagascar is home to uh, several dozen ethnic groups, and this was uh, a forest on the Bara people's land. And so uh, with their collaboration, we now refer to this forest as uh, the Ibohiburu Protected Area. And so with the work that I was involved in, we were so honored to be able to call it a protected area through the surveying work that we had done. Now, to give you a bit of background on why this forest is interesting, um, there was a research team out at Stony Brook who had done some preliminary surveys in this area and found that it contains a really unique composition of species. So uh, it is classified as a wet forest, but they did find considerable uh, dry, ooh, dry forest species as well. I'd like to go back. There we go. Um, and I, uh, I did want to point out that the team here uh, surveyed this forest over a period of about 90 days and four separate expeditions. These included diurnal and nocturnal surveys, several many transects, acoustic surveys, baited traps, and baited cameras. Um, just to say that the surveying was extensive. It was a massive effort to try to understand what lives in this forest. And so I learned of this approach, and I knew that what they really needed was someone to go in and survey some leeches. Um, because from the work that I had done, we found that leeches really provide a distinct contribution to the biodiversity that people don't always spot. So those things that are too camouflaged or too small to be picked up by camera traps, the leeches often will get. So I just want to take you on a journey to this fragment. 
Um, it is in the south central region of Madagascar. It was a four hour uphill, uphill hike through this burnt terrain. Um, and in this central region, uh, there are routine fires that burn through. Um, some villagers believe that it helps promote um, grass growth for grazing. <clears throat> and so this practice is widespread and uh, it's mainly for subsistence farming. But as you're hiking, really the last thing you expect to see is a wet rainforest. Um, and so what happens is after hours and hours of hiking, you hear the forest before you see it. And uh, you suddenly hear parrots calling from fragment to fragment. And this, here they are. So hike, hiking up this, this hill was something I'll never forget because you just don't expect it, and I can't emphasize that enough. It looked like we were hiking the surface of Mars, and coming down and looking below and seeing this sea of green is, um, yeah, something I'll never forget. So we were camped out in this cloud forest, um, which sounds romantic, but um, you're at the very minimum always damp, um, and as are all your belongings. So it's it's not easy, I would say, but it, it is part of the job that I enjoy. And uh, just to give you an idea for, for what we accomplished, I collected 1,492 leeches from this fragment. <laughs> um, and this was my sampling strategy. We sampled along um, some primitive trails and some streams. And these are our results. Uh, these are some of the more notable species level identifications that we were able to make out of the guts of leeches. And so I'm sure some of you can recognize the iconic uh, lemurs, the ring-tailed lemurs, which Madagascar is so known for, um, along with you know, many other of these species are also endangered, as you can see indicated here. Something that I like to point out is that the massive surveying effort that was done with Stony Brook's team over the course of 90 days and four expeditions failed to capture these three frog species, which I managed to get with the leeches in one expedition of 10 days with a team of two people. So um, it's pretty exciting to be able to, to provide that information uh, so quickly. So this is just an overview comparison to give you an idea of um, the diversity that was uncovered by my surveys as compared to the, the team at Stony Brook. CVB is the name of the research station um, in Madagascar where they're based. So uh, yeah, in 10 days with two people, I managed to pick up 15% of the species that they detected over 90 days and four years. And I just wanted to make a quick distinction. Um, because the nature of the DNA that I collect is degraded, it's coming out of leech guts, so sometimes it can be a little bit digested or fragmented, um, I perform the analyses at both the species level, so um, at the species resolution, where I can identify both, both a genus and a species. Um, but sometimes the DNA is too degraded to make a uh, definitive uh, classification at the species level, so we make a broader classification by the family level. So this is just using uh, humans, homo sapiens, as an example for this uh, taxonomic classification system. So when I refer to something as being at the family level, this is what I mean. Uh, and so again, here are our family level detections. So all of our results by family. Um, we detected 38% of the families that the Stony Brook team had detected, again, over a period of 90 days and four expeditions. And this curve here just goes to show that um, there are still new uh, species waiting to be discovered because this, this line here hasn't quite hit a horizontal. So despite the massive sampling effort that we've done, there are still more species uh, out there waiting to be discovered. And uh, I just thought I'd highlight the families that the iDNA or the, yeah, the ingested DNA, the leech DNA that I'm using um, was able to detect. And it's these uh, cat, oops, 
sorry. Uh, cats, fish, skinks, and small rodents. So again, stuff that is really small, usually very well camouflaged, usually um, goes unnoticed by camera traps and even people who have been trained to detect these species. So uh, some of the main takeaways that I wanted to leave you with is that um, this technique, this iDNA ingested DNA through the guts of leeches, is able to detect mostly uh, small ground-dwelling species, often unaccounted for by traditional surveys. Um, I also found that the leeches from Madagascar feed indiscriminately across groups, so uh, that's really useful for people using them in biodiversity surveys. There aren't host specialists. They feed quite broadly. And uh, I don't ever knock any other forms of sampling because no sampling method is imperfect. Um, I instead advocate for the use of leeches uh, in complement to more traditional surveys, of course, where these terrestrial leeches are available. So I just wanted to thank all of you and um, my sponsors, Stell Raven, the Explorers Club. Thanks so much, my uh, one question. We can do a quick one. How long does it take before you draw Repeat the question. Okay. Uh, so how long does it take before leeches draw blood? And that is after they've latched? Is that your question? Okay. Um, usually within seconds. <laughs> they don't really linger <laughs> that long. Um, they get they get to business, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we want to keep the focus uh, uh, a bit on the presenters, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna jump over um, to our next presenter. Uh, I'm gonna first uh, introduce the grants program um, that he was awarded. Um, wait, sorry, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna skip over the quick info session for grants uh, for a minute. Um, this is all related to applying for grants, uh, which all of these are incredibly difficult. Um, they're oftentimes uh, less than five percent acceptance rate, so pretty much harder than Harvard. Um, so I'm just uh, pulling up some some announcements um, of uh, of grantees. Um, but it was really amazing this year uh, to have uh, several new grant programs. Um, and uh, one of these is a grant program that is focused on ocean and marine conservation. Uh, and this is the Stevenson Exploration Advancement Program, acronym C. Uh, and this is a foundation that has been working with the top explorers around the world, uh, which include Enrique Sala and Pristine Seas, uh, Bob Ballard, Sylvia Earle, and uh, this initiative was actually to support the next generation of these change makers uh, in the world of oceans. And specifically, uh, we have a few projects that is in one of their areas uh, in particular, which is coral restoration. Um, so I'm going to announce some of these grantees, um, which will be really exciting. And then we're going to have the executive director, Eugene Bobao, who is going to uh, talk a little bit more um, about the Stevenson Foundation. Uh, so the first uh, grant that I would like to announce is the Neha Acharya Patel's uh, research using environmental DNA and scuba diving to survey keystone rocks, uh, rockfish species, species in central, um, uh, in, in central northwest uh, Pacific uh, uh, areas. So that's going to be a really interesting project. Uh, along with that is uh, Yulawati Amana which is a coral reef restoration and conservation project uh, in the Biosphere Foundation Initiative in Indonesia. Um, that is one of the coral restoration projects. Uh, the next one is Russell Laman, which is a coral reef restoration success in the Raja Ampat Archipelago in Indonesia. Uh, and the, the last one is Gioia Skeltis, which is a nuclear radiation uh, levels in marine fish from the Marshall Islands. So this is an amazing project and relevant to the presentation 
that was earlier in the day uh, by James Raffin, um, which is a flag expedition. So um, if we could have uh, Eugene come up and tell us a little bit more about the Stevenson Foundation, and then we're going to watch uh, a film. Thank you, Trevor. Um, compared to what you've seen and heard, uh, I don't have much to say. The Philip Stevenson Foundation is a small family private foundation focused on marine conservation and exploration. In addition to the flagship grants that Trevor mentioned, I'm not going to repeat them. You know who they are. You can find them on our website. Uh, we're really excited to start this new grant program with the Explorers Club. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Emerald. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, all of you. And uh, without further ado, because we don't have explorers to present yet, these guys just won the grant. So next year, we hope to have one of these exciting people present to you all. We're going to roll a film on a coral restoration project we've been working on in the southern Grenadines. This is footage that's about four years old. In the meantime, the coral has grown fantastically. So you'll see what we've done so far and next year, exciting explorers. Thank you, guys. Petit St. Vincent is in itself a hope spot within the greater hope spot. But if you're there's energy. People are focused on trying to restore coral, individual species that once was a dominant species here. When I first came to the Caribbean in the 1950s, it was a different world. People ask me sometimes, where's your favorite place to dive? And I say, almost anywhere 50 years ago. Well, the foundation's about four years old, and it focuses exclusively on promoting marine exploration and protection. Uh, we do this globally with organizations like Mission Blue and National Geographic who are looking at the very big picture. But we also do quite specific, tangible things here in the Caribbean around this island of Petit St. Vincent. Uh, we are established, we're working with the government and local communities to build support for a no-take marine protected area, which will keep uh, the kind of destructive fishing away from the coral reefs we're trying to repair. We recently uh, uh, supported a project from a UK-based group that is replanting fast-growing elkhorn coral on the eastern Atlantic facing side of our island. And these are all uh, not only theoretical things that sound good, but you can get out there if you're one of our guests or one of our partners, and you can actually see and feel and touch what we're doing. So the aim of the coral restoration program is to bring back the elkhorn coral, which had been the dominant coral species throughout the Caribbean in the shallow reefs. But in the 1980s, there was this devastating epidemic called white band disease, which killed about 98% of all Elkhorn and left large areas of the reef pretty much barren with fragments of dead coral and no shelter for fish or lobsters. So today, there's a regional effort to bring back Elkhorn by finding the survivors, the resilient genotypes, and propagating these in underwater nurseries. And when they're big enough, we take cuttings from them and we plant them back on the reef to restore the reef ecosystem. And we've got about 130 people who work here on the island and about a dozen have, have, have volunteered uh, to take scuba diving training, become scuba diving certified, and they're actually out there, uh, each of them, once a week or so, maintaining the coral, uh, cleaning it. Uh, eventually they'll be out planting it, taking it from the little nursery trays and actually cementing it onto the barrier reef where the elkhorn coral used to grow. The corals take a good couple of years to grow big enough. To uh, survive on your own. Yeah, to survive and clean themselves, themselves, but still, they will need a little assistance, like to take off the fireworms or the snails that kill them. Maybe a bad weather might pass and algae might take over them, so they'll still need a little nurture as we plant them out. But we'll see how that goes in the future. I saw that you were um, growing coral there, and it was pretty cool. The coral is for coral transplants to restore the coral reef. Uh-huh. And why are we doing that? Um, 
to help conserve the ocean. We're cleaning the coral because of algae. Algae and parasites can get into the coral, make them sick, and eat the coral, and kill the coral. So that's why we have to clean them every once in a while. I want to give back something to the sea, to the ocean. Because I know human is what destroyed the ocean. When I was a little boy, and you go to the sea, you go to the rocks, you see tons of fish, beautiful corals that I never know about. I only look at the, the ocean as where you can go and get fish on bed, nothing else. I never know about corals or uh, their importance. I get curious. I say I want to learn this. Because they, they said um, they talk about getting solidified, scuba solidified, and that's something else interesting. And the opportunity comes and I grab it. So I'm very happy. I'm excited every time I go to the corals, I always proud. I'm a certified diver and I'm now part of a coral restoration conservation team, right? So for me, it, it's a great experience and I think that it's something that will last for how long? Forever, forever. <laughs> so through a combination of protecting the fish that protect the reef, replanting corals on the reefs um, and doing things sort of responsibly both on land and at sea we hope that over time uh, these reefs will regenerate we know it works because we've seen it work about 10 miles north of here in the Tobago Keys National Marine Park which is actually in better shape today than it was two decades ago due to the regime of protection it had the coral gives the fish homes and fish well they eat all the algae and stuff off the coral so the coral doesn't get sick and die. The first time I went under the water, it changed my perspective of what was going to be there and what I wanted to do. It got me by the ball. <laughs> so I was really, really, really into it. And as I did it and I planted, planted corals and know what coral is all about, it just got me there and it's something that I would like to, I will continue doing even if I'm not still on PSV. Maybe I'll find somewhere else who will do something like this and give my skills that I've learned because I've got a lot of skills I'm certified. <laughs> I'm a little marine farmer, a little coral farmer. Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say yes, I'm a parent. So, what do you think this is going to what is this project going to be? Uh, it's going to be to lots of uh, very colorful coral and um, more coral. Okay. And with the coral comes what? Fish. 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 We must have to cut the fire on the fish in the Caribbean. Over each and every island they do. Say thanks again to the, the Stevenson Foundation. Pat and Pat choose an alternative. So what? What? Yeah, another round of applause. One of the amazing things is that, you know, we, we hear so much about the effects of climate change, environmental degradation, and here you have such an, a clear example of, of a spot of hope and not, not just work, uh, you know, going off to far-flung places, but you can see how well-embraced the community is. And it's actually a trend amongst all the, all the grantees, which we're really proud of, uh, that this is really integrated with local people, uh, doing work uh, that benefits local communities, uh, and really giving back. So thanks again for that. Um, so we're getting closer to the end of the program. Uh, I really want to thank all of you for hanging in there. This is kind of uh, uh, an incredible feat of endurance in itself. It's been a long weekend, uh, but we are explorers. I think we can hang in there. Um, and uh, there, last but not very least, we do have a pretty incredible uh, program that's been going, uh, which you probably all have heard about. It's the Discovery Program. Uh, and we're very excited about this. 
uh, for a lot of different reasons. It's funded our largest single grants. It's funded uh, the largest group of explorers and funding that we've ever been able to put out. Uh, but one of the things that I think is uh, uh, really impressive is that this work was able to be done over the pandemic. And uh, I remember the first time uh, that uh, I talked to, to Peter on the phone, who's our, our, our next presenter, and uh, he told me a little bit about a lost shipwreck story, which just got my imagination firing immediately. Uh, a steamship from the 1850s that he'll tell you all about. But the thing is, is that we're in the midst of a, of a global pandemic and we were, you know, basically we launched this big partnership, this big grant program, uh, and we didn't know if we'd be able to pull it off. Uh, we didn't know if Peter would be able to pull it off. He started to tell me about, uh, you know, his work uh, with INA, the Instituto, Instituto Nacional de Historia and Antropología in, in Mexico. They've been working with them for decades, and I thought, wow, okay, if they trust you, they don't give that trust so easily, so I think you could probably do it. And, uh, you know, a scuba diver since he was 15 years old, uh, I think he could probably put it together. Uh, so first we're going to watch a little Discovery Sizzle video, which will have some footage from his expedition, and then we'll have the man himself, Peter Tattersfield. All right, so we'll roll that. Good afternoon, and thanks for waiting for uh, my presentation. It's uh, it's really been a, a culmination, and as Trevor said, fighting through the pandemic was uh, no no small feat. And uh, Trevor, uh, coming flying in from Mexico after I was looking at the uh, agenda, my big fear was not the pandemic or coming into New York, New York City. My biggest fear was going after the frogman from Ecuador. I mean, how do you go after that guy? And, uh, well, unfortunately, he couldn't make it. But uh, how can you go after these grantees? It's unbelievable. You guys have put out some great, great stories, and I'm very fortunate to be part of that team. Uh, my name's Peter Tattersfield. I'm the director of Kashan Nautical Foundation, a foundation I founded about two years ago, three years ago. And our mission is to inspire conservation and preservation of nautical heritage through exploration, discovery, and community engagement. I was at the dinner last night and coming into this facility, I've been looking forward to coming here for the better part of two months. Just the, the anticipation, my daughter came in, my mother's here. It's a real reunion for me. And so I'm very touched to be here with you all. But uh, what I came away with last night, there's a very famous saying in Mexico that estás en tu mole, you're in your mole. What that basically translates into, you're in your element. And coming into the Explorers Club, I feel like I'm in my element. So thank you very much for having me here. And as Trevor mentioned, um, uh, I couldn't do this work without the participation and collaboration of Ina. 
the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia. They have jurisdiction over all archaeological sites in Mexico, both above land and below water. And if you want to meet a finer group of professionals dedicated to conservation and preservation of heritage, above water and below, I would be honored to introduce you to the director of marine archaeology, Roberto Junco, and his incredible team of marine archaeologists that I've been working with for the better part of two to three decades. I want to take a moment. I've got people all over. I, got a, I cannot stand up here. I am not an island. I didn't get here by myself. I got here through the help and collaboration of others. And so give me a minute while I run through my list. First of all, my wife in Mexico City, she's a teacher, and her fifth grade class that I believe is chiming in or tuning in from Mexico City from the American School. We've got with me today, I have two members of the foundation. I've got Juan Castro, who you're going to see the work that he put together in the video that's coming up, who's a well-known documentary uh, photographer in Mexico, and also Miguel Fernandez, who's helping lead our research that we conduct. We don't go out to the ocean without uh, having a guide or a compass, or we'll be spending a lot of time in the field looking. But it's the research that you do prior that helps you narrow your focus and pinpoint the locations of the stuff that we're looking for. Friends and family all over Mexico, all over the United States, thank you for joining us today. And most importantly, thank you to the Explorers Club. Thank you, Trevor, Emerald. You guys have been phenomenal in helping put this together for me. And uh, you took a chance on me. You took a chance on an individual coming from Mexico, pitching a dream. And you guys helped me live that dream. And I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today to showcase that dream. I had to condense the work into a 12-minute video. And I hope that you guys, through the grants that you put together, and I've received two, that you see the return on those investments. So if we can move forward and uh, go into the uh, video, I'll let this uh, video do the talking from here now forward because the scenes, the animals, the history of this wreck speaks for itself. And it does a much better job on video than I can sitting up here in the podium. But thank you. Isla Margarita is a magical island guarding the entrance to Bahia Magdalena off Baja's Pacific coast. She plays host to a rich variety of flora and fauna. We recently uncovered cave art and carved petroglyphs. She is also a ship killer. Her waters are littered with ship remains, including the SS Independence. I'm Peter Tattersteel filming today from beautiful Isla Margarita. South of the island on Punta Tosca, there's a very treacherous area called La Reina, this rock just behind me. She's captured a lot of wrecks in over the course of centuries. And in 1853, the SS Independence was sailing northbound from Nicaragua when she impaled herself on this rock. She was able to back off, and the captain, seeing she was mortally wounded, made a beeline to the island looking for a cove so that he could beach her. He made it three miles north of here and found a beach, but while he attempted to beach her, he ran into some more rocks, the boilers exploded, and 129 people were killed in this accident. The ship has been lost in time, but we're going to find her this week. The 1850s is the height of the gold rush era. And prospectors were busy making their way from New York to San Francisco and the Pacific Northwest. There were two travel options available at the time. One was a five to six month overland march across the U.S. continent or a 35 day voyage by steamship. There were 402 passengers and 60 of the crew. The ship was small, so of course we were considerably crowded. We had no sickness on board and got along very pleasantly until the morning of the 16th. 
We were awakened on the morning by the concussion of the boat and striking on a reef of rocks that run out of Margarita Island. When the ship struck, I jumped out of bed and called Mr. Watson to get up, for the boat was sinking. In 2018, we set about uh, with a grant to locate the SS Independence. And in 2019, we had another expedition. The thing is that we were looking in the inside part of the island. No? So little by little, we were covering all the coastline between Punta Tosca, the southern tip, uh, and towards the north. We've located Captain Sampson's testimony from an old California newspaper. In this testimony, which he gave upon arriving with the survivors in San Francisco, he mentions that he struck rocks on the south side of the island. He was able to disengage from the rocks, and though the ship was severely damaged, he sailed her up the coast for approximately four miles and spotted a cove. On a recent trip to survey the west coast of the island, local fishermen referred to a cove as El Vapor which translates to the steamer. One of the passengers, his last name Cross, sketched the scene of the disaster, and I hoped our guides could recognize any similar features from that sketch. They also mentioned that on Vapor Bay, there occasionally appeared human remains on the beach. That was significant, as on the day of the disaster, over 70 bodies washed ashore. Armed with this new intelligence and the Explorers Club grant, we launched our expedition. Our strategy was to start by surveying Punta Tosca and trace the route of the independence up the west coast of the island. We did this from the air, by boat, and underwater. If anything appeared interesting on the sonar, we dispatched divers to investigate. Now in three days of constant search, we did locate the remains of the SS Columbia, which sank in 1931 off of Punta Tosca. But other than that, our three days worth of effort yielded zero results. We had to refocus our search on the beach the locals referred to as El Vapor. Some of the variables that we've encountered out here in trying to reach the bay, it's only accessible by the beach coming from the west or traversing the island coming from the east. Today, high winds, lots of wave, we can't get there by boat, so we're, having, we're opting for the hike. Crossing the island to El Vapor Bay is a beautiful five mile hike over uneven terrain. But upon arrival, I felt confident that we had arrived at the right spot. This is the bay. Look at the similarities between that sketch and the scene that you have here today. It's incredible. The SS Independence is trying to make it to this beach right here when it impales itself on these rocks and catches fire. Within minutes, she's a sheet of flames and the passengers and crew are lunging themselves into the ocean to survive. 129 of those passengers don't make it. 200 of them make it to shore. As was custom at the time, newspapers would publish lists of the passengers and crew, both when they departed and who arrived back at the port. And on all of those uh, lists, the name Thomas Sawyer appears as a crew member. Thomas Sawyer was in the engineering department, and he was probably stoking the furnaces. Thomas Sawyer saved maybe 90 people, and that he actually took one of the lifeboats back and rescued more people and towed some to, to land. When he arrived at San Francisco, he joined the first volunteer fire department. Thomas Sawyer met a gentleman by the name of Samuel Clemens. Samuel Clemens, of course, was the author of Mark Twain. And we believe that the novel that Mark Twain wrote, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, were in part inspired by the great storytelling that uh, Thomas Sawyer had told him. Today's truly the day. We've uncovered beans of an old shipwreck that our archaeologists are digging out. We've found the locations of the mass grave with the presence of a human skull above the high water line that uh, Captain Sanson had ordered buried. Bueno, este, en estos montículos de arena se localiza, se localizó lo que corresponde a un cráneo humano que estaba descubierto por la acción de la erosión y del aire. 
On November 3rd, 2020, during our original expedition, we discovered the remains of the SS Independence buried under the stand in the tidal zone of El Vapor Bay, including what appeared to be a significant piece, the ship's paddle wheel axle. On December 2021, we returned to Vapor Bay along with several archaeologists and divers to further catalog the wreck site. Our main objectives included uncovering and photographing the ship's paddle wheel axle and other remains, and retrieving a skull from the mass grave to perform DNA and facial reconstruction work. I remember this piece from last year, buried in sand. We were able to find her with a metal detector, and it, we uh, did a test bit and exposed her. Today, we see that there's a lot more to offer with this piece, and you can see the phenomenon of that layer of cement that's encrusting this wreck. Our original exploration dates were scheduled for early December 2021, but the Mexican naval base of uh, Puerto Cortes conducted military exercises, and we lost four days. Losing those four days had serious consequences. The timing of the low tide was now going to be 3 p.m., leaving us very little daylight as the sun set at 6. And the cyclical nature of the low tide also meant that she was not going to be low enough to fully expose the paddle wheel axle. We did not retrieve the human skull and the tides impacted our ability to expose the shafts. My guide Rafa Sanchez noted my frustration and mentioned to me that there was a super low tide which takes place annually and that we could get to El Vapor Bay by Jeep. I had to go back. Access to El Vapor Bay from the north had always been restricted by cliffs and raging surf. Today, during the low tide, we hiked around those obstacles. Rafa was right. With one final obstacle remaining, we climbed up the last hill and were greeted with an incredible sight. This is my fourth trying out to the Isla Margarita in search of the SS Independence, and we hit it right. In front of me is the paddleship steamer SS Independence Axle. We've walked over this spot before, but we've never had her exposed like what she is today. And to our surprise, we also found a second shaft just right behind me. What a great surprise. There are two communities on Isla Margarita the Puerto Cortes Naval Base, and the fishing village of Alcatraz. Alcatraz is home to 50 families who sustain themselves through fishing. There are over 25 children. There's a kindergarten, an elementary school, a medical clinic, a church, a desalination plant, and a small diesel power plant providing electricity until 11 p.m. every night. I've been visiting this island over the past four years, and the community of Alcatraz has hosted our team on every expedition. They house and feed us, while the fishermen have been an invaluable resource with their knowledge of the local waters. They've integrated into our team and become friends. Our journey hasn't finished. Kashan Nautical Foundation is in the process of securing a permit to build a small community museum for Alcatraz to showcase its history, flora and fauna, and nautical heritage. We hope this structure will help develop a sustainable tourism model and diversify their economy and impact their lives. Uh, thanks to the collaboration and the uh, partnership that we've been uh, having with the uh, Kashan Foundation, with Peter Tattersfield, uh, we were able to locate finally the resting place of the SS Independence and some of the really interesting archaeological uh, materials. I want to thank the Explorers Club for giving me a shot 
and bringing the SS Independence back to life. Finding this ship has been a dream come true, and we're very fortunate to have the patronage of the Explorers Club behind us. So, a uh, uh, question for Peter? You know, I get that question all the time, but it's usually it's from the women. <laughs> um, uh, this The ship was heading northbound, so it was sailing from Nicaragua up to San Francisco, so it was mostly carrying dreamers, people who were going north to go pursue the gold. So, no, there, were, there was no gold. Yes, ma'am. That is, we, we hit it right during COVID. And believe me, I was very skeptical that we were going to pull it off. Um, uh, they ended up being, we ended up being a team of 19 of us. And the one thing that I did not want to do was be the vehicle that took COVID to that island because I would have decimated that community. And so we became the most tested COVID patients in Mexico. We had, we tested a week before departure the day before departure, the day we landed in La Paz, and before we set foot on that island, we tested again. And on our team, we had a doctor. And if you woke up with a sniffle, your ass was going into the clinic and you were quarantined in there. We couldn't run any risk. So we took a lot of precautions. I lost a photographer the week before the trip, the underwater photographer. I had to scramble and get a replacement. I wasn't going to let the Discovery and the Explorers Club not have images of the trip. And uh, we were able to locate a top uh, marine uh, photographer for the trip. Yeah. So in, in part of our work in uh, establishing a foundation, we want to do, we have a mission, and that mission is to inspire uh, nautical preservation and conservation. And we're doing that with local communities. Um, I'm going back to Isla Margarita. I, I think I may have even picked up two explorers last night at the dinner that want to come with me, but they got to go through the interview process yet. <laughs> There's actually a U.S. submarine, this submarine, is uh, a U.S. naval submarine that sank in 1920, and it is a mile from the SS Independence. So we're going back there, and what we believe that uh, we're going to be able to accomplish, these are remote areas, very few visitors. I'm not giving you the coordinates, right? I'm not giving you the coordinates today. But it's our hope that if we can inspire those local fishing communities, that they will become the custodians of these sites so that eventually when you do go out for a visit, they will know who is on these sites, what time, who visited, and when. They will take you, and they will make sure and have every interest to protect its preservation for their generation and the next. And it's that whole concept of sustainable tourism that we're trying to establish. If this, if this model works here in Isla Margarita, it is highly replicable in other areas in Mexico and Central and South America. So this is our benchmark. This is where we're starting. I hope it's the first of many to come. Yes? Any cargo that they were hauling? Um, uh, if you saw from the wreck site and the remains of this ship, this, this vessel struck rocks and caught fire. And so it was a wooden vessel, and she literally burnt down to the water line, right? So the, the remains are mostly iron remains. And when you get beat by that surf for 170 years, there's not a whole heck of a lot left. And what is left is buried under about a meter, three feet of sand. So it would take a tremendous effort to excavate any work out there. And uh, you saw in the video that one phenomena, there was one low tide. I mean, my wife was handing me divorce papers, literally, because I went back to that site after New Year's. But I had to go see that site during this phenomena of this low tide. And you saw that beam. That beam was prior to that buried under three feet of sand. And when we got out there, she was totally exposed. So it only happens about twice a year during the winter months. 
And uh, we, we've come to the conclusion that we think the best place for the SS Independence to be is right where she is today. So, real quick, I'll run through these real quick. These are some of the projects that I'm working on that are coming up. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, as I mentioned, there is a U.S. naval submarine, and it's sunk about a mile north of where the SS Independence is. Gross navigational error, and uh, the captain literally rode her up on a beach. Four uh, American sailors were killed in 1920. When they tried to uh, recover the submarine, they damaged the uh, watertight integrity of the submarine, and she took on water and sank in 60 feet of water right off the coast. The Navy claimed that she was scrapped and sold for scrap, and they basically erased her from the record books. So there's no history of this submarine. And five years ago, those, that community of Alcatraz was fishing, and somebody snagged uh, some fishing line on the wreck, and they dropped down and discovered the submarine. We're going back in early May to go lay a memorial plaque and establish this submarine as a living museum of the sea. So that's a project that we have ongoing. Uh, there's the plaque, the system that we're putting in place. Again, this is in collaboration with Ina, my alma mater, Indiana University, and uh, Kashan uh, Nautical Foundation. So we're putting all those ingredients together. I hope we have a good uh, uh, expedition in early May. This one I think you're going to find incredible. Um, uh, the story of Gilberto Bosque, who was a Mexican ambassador during World War II in France. He makes Schindler look like an amateur. This guy issued over 40,000 visas to Jews from, and saved them from persecution, to Spaniards and Jews in persecution in World War II. And he gave them a chance for a new life in Mexico. I live in Polanco in Mexico City, and I believe in my community a lot of these uh, survivors um, are there today. He was eventually picked up by the Gestapo, and uh, his family, the consulate, were all imprisoned in, Ger in Germany and held there for a couple of years. There was a prisoner exchange between Germany and France in 1944, and he was released. And it's those prisoners that he was exchanged for that I'm a little weak on our research. Miguel, you've got to get on that. But uh, we're trying to find a link um, uh, between who that, those uh, German uh, prisoners were. We believe they were members of a German submarine that was sunk off of Mexico's uh, Veracruz coast. And we have found remains that uh, closely assimilate that wreck. Uh, it's deep water, very, very challenging dives. Very few people are qualified to do this type of dive in Mexico. But we've got a great team, and uh, we spent five minutes on that wreck site about two years ago. So we're going to try to get back there this summer and pull back more evidence of what that ship is. Um, another one is Arrecife Sacramento, which is north of Isla Margarita. There is the SS Sacramento, and uh, you'll see a reef off of uh, the coast called Arrecife Sacramento named appropriately for this Gold Rush era steamer that sank in 1872. So we've got multiple objectives at that particular reef. And recently, Roberto Junco and a fisherman uncovered a Chinese vase. Uh, he was able to identify the origin, thinks this uh, vase is over 300 years old. What is it doing off the coast of uh, Baja California? Well, we're going to go and try and find out. So we've got a lot of exciting projects. It keeps us on our toes. The biggest one for me is to finish this museum for uh, Isla Margarita and these children and the families to help diversify their economy and showcase their flora and fauna history. And uh, in doing so, we'll establish a sustainable tourism model that will help impact their lives. But thank you, and uh, I appreciate the time. Man, he just doesn't stop. Uh, it's like every every time, uh, he's, oh, I'm on my way back to Isla Margarita. I was like, I thought you were just there. 
And uh, all these other projects are, are, are so exciting. Um, and I mean, among the discovery grantees, you, you represent them incredibly well, Peter. I mean, there's an Apollo astronaut among them. There's the, you know, people who are the first to film the Titanic. So you're in good company. Um, I want to acknowledge a, another new grant that, that we are really excited to announce. Um, I think that there's something worth acknowledging uh, about our club uh, being uh, over 100 years old. There's a lot of different types of history that's integrated into the DNA of who we are. And I don't think that we can really truly move forward in a progressive way without understanding what happened in the past. Um, and by understanding that, I mean the types of people who are allowed to explore, who are allowed to be part of this club. And I think we've made incredible strides. Uh, I'm proud that the grant program was actually giving grants to women before women were members, oddly enough. Um, but I think that rather than, uh, you know, issuing a statement or doing something uh, as a gesture, one of the things that we definitely wanted to do, and this is part of the work that we've been doing as our, uh, with our DEI committee, which I'm a member of, um, is to try to create initiatives that get other types of explorers out into the field, that it's not just a statement, it's not just a window dressing uh, of including diversity and in exploration, uh, but something that actually changes a bit of our club, not our mission, um, not anything about what we're trying to do in terms of field science, um, but creating it as a more accessible way to explore. And that means including people who may have not had the traditional routes uh, of academia and science, uh, people who come from different backgrounds uh, around the world. So I was talking all about all of this uh, uh, last year when we were at GLEX uh, with Robin Brooks. And uh, she, was, uh, she was telling me all of these things. I said, you know, like, is there anything that we could do um, together? And she said, oh, I already had an idea. And I was already pitching it and working uh, with club staff with it already. And I was like, ah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> she was already on it. Um, and we put together um, this amazing new grant initiative, which is called the Exploration Without Boundaries Grant. And it's sponsored by Exodus Travels uh, that does incredible uh, rugged adventure travel around the world. Please check them out. Um, and we wanted to select grantees that were doing work uh, in the countries that they travel to, which is not difficult because it's how many countries, Robin? <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I want to show uh, the, the, the foundation reel, um, and maybe we can bring Robin up uh, to talk a little bit. Oh, she may have lost her voice. Uh, <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll let the video speak uh, for Exodus uh, and uh, a round of applause for them uh, putting uh, real support behind uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative.
So uh, as you can see, we're, you know, this Exploration Without Boundaries grant is one of many incredible initiatives that, that Exodus is doing all around the world. I think, you know, we're all travelers, we're all, all explorers, but always thinking how can we do it more culturally and environmentally sustainable. And just huge thanks to Robin, who's a member, who thought of us to include us in, in, in all that they're doing. Um, so I'm really excited now to, to invite all of our grantees up um, on the stage to, to, to get a photo together, and then we'll do uh, a few questions to, to close. So all of our presenters, if we could, if we could get up, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So we're gonna have a, a mic going around for questions. Oh. One more. <laughs> okay. So um, if anybody has any questions for any of the grantees, uh, we'll have a mic with Luis. He'll go around, and then I'll pass the mic here. Luis, we got one over there. Alejandro. Alejandro? Alfredo. Alfredo? How do you make those? Alfredo? Thank you. Sorry, my lack of knowledge of this. Your postcards of ICE, are they ready for publication? Can they be distributed? Is it a book? or are the actual postcards. I've been looking for years for an image to spread that people would begin to under, understand how important what you're, what you're doing, what you're seeing is. Yeah, um, well, we edited a, a small book that we're giving for free on uh, photo exhibitions in Chile. We made a photo exhibition in Puerto Williams, that it's the southernmost town in the world. Then we did a photo exhibition in Punta Arenas, and yeah, of course they are ready to, to be published if somebody's interested in, in publishing it. Yeah. I'm very interested to be able to help distribute them. Let's connect, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a, a lot of you, thank you for sharing, uh, firstly, and inspiring us on uh, um, today. Uh, a lot of you have been trying to build uh, more sustainable models uh, with communities. What are the main lessons learned that you find in trying to develop these benchmarks and the, uh, with, with the complexity of each uh, uh, region that you're working with? Um, yeah, well, regarding my project, um, I try to to work with local people. Of course, they have the knowledge, uh, the the logistic as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm interested in in share the time with the people. That's what I love of my my work. Like I'm not specialized in anything but filmmaking, but that allows me to to experience uh, other uh, lifestyles. So I try to spend uh, as much time as I can with, with local people. And, and yeah, that's, that's yeah, a bit. Um, in Madagascar, it's actually a requirement as a foreign researcher to hire a Malagasy field technician, 
research guide, and local guide. So that's a team of three Malagasy people on the ground with any single foreign researcher. And so, of course, that effort has um, helped uh, bring more Malagasy natives into sort of the academic world uh, within Madagascar and, and getting them started in the field uh, helps, you know, build their CVs and get them to university and they become renowned, world-renowned scientists and conservationists for their own country, which has been, uh, yeah, huge. So it's really great to be a part of that system. In my case, I would say that I'm local. <laughs> so most, many of these cases are in my hometown. So I'm, I'm really proud of that because I, when I, when I went abroad uh, to do my PhD, when I came abroad to do my PhD here, I wanted to uh, contribute to the scientific knowledge of my own country. So like many of the things that uh, when I go back and I mentor students, there are also uh, other biologists that also went to the same university that I went. So I'm mentoring them and sharing my experience uh, going abroad and coming back. So that's, yeah. Yeah, for me, um, everything we do is driven by the community. Um, and I think the most important and exciting piece of it is really getting to see where your own biases lie. And we've got a lot of logic and ways of thinking about the world that we take for granted. And so having things be led by the community, you really see that there's a lot of different ways of doing things, a lot of different ways of thinking, and a lot of different ways of being. And um, there's a lot to learn. I got a more specific question with, um, to you, if, if I can, just one minute. Um, you're trying to, uh, do, what do you think of companies that are trying to uh, value ecosystem services in the Amazons? I know the complexity of the Amazon is the amount of trafficking that there is and the fact that communities, uh, um, as you explained, uh, go through uh, trying to sustain themselves economically in, in ways that are extremely dangerous and uh, are very difficult to unravel. But um, what do you think of these structures? Would you want them to be able to financially live off the research that they're doing, or do they not want to have those those systems? That's a good question. It's something we kind of go back and forth on a lot. Um, we've got a number of sustainable development projects, um, ranging from small ecotourism to uh, research uh, field guides and that kind of thing, as well as partnerships with uh, Whole Foods and Lush or Body Shop, I'm not sure which one right now, on different um, products that uh, come from the Amazon, and it's all conservation-based. So um, the products like Brazil nuts, for example, can't be grown on a plantation. They have to be within an intact forest, so it really incentivizes conservation. Um, but more on the ecosystem services, we are considering a sort of, uh, I guess, carbon offset Thing, but it's it's really challenging, and so uh, we don't have a clear answer on whether or not that's something that the communities want to do or how it would work. There's a lot of uh, yeah okay. challenges for sure with that, and um, positives I guess that can come out of it, but also uh, a lot of negatives that come with uh, putting a price on nature. For sure. If you want to get into contact with the Brazilian ESG fund, we should chat. Fabulous. That would be amazing. In, in my case, for uh, sustainable tourism, well, that's not going to happen overnight. There's not going to be 100 tourists going to Isla Margarita tomorrow. And so the biggest thing that we had to do was build trust. We had to build relationships with that local community. And we were given the option many times of staying and spending the night on the naval base, sleeping in a nice bed with a bunk, and I wouldn't allow that. I wanted to make sure that we integrated into that community and we slept in their sofas or swung a hammock in their living room. They fed us and we paid them for their services. And so we left an economic impact and now when we go back, they receive us. They love us coming back. And we're trying to instill that spirit that, hey, good things are coming. We've got a, we got a museum to build, we got a story to tell, and there are people out there that are hungry to learn about your island and your history. It's not going to happen overnight, but every single little grain of sand helps. And so we're doing it every single day. And when we go back on uh, May the 4th, we'll be staying with the families again and, uh, and leaving that little impact with them when we leave. Awesome.
Great. With that, I just want to close with saying how proud I am of all these grantees and how you you represent our club so well. Um, and in just that last response, how you're doing exploration and research so ethically, so integrated with the community, and in some cases your own community, which is amazing. And uh, yeah, another round of applause. And now we're free to mingle and make all those amazing connections that seem to be happening very organically.